Is there anything that you wrote, any scenes you wrote about that you cut that you still like? Yes, in fact, I have thought about this. I wish I had, <laughs> I had, I'd spent days and days, I'm serious, and it took <laughs> days to write about Dougie's first breakfast with Sonny Jim, where he's sitting there and he has his first cup of coffee and the yeah. music is playing and there's the owl cookie jar behind him. Um, I went through that scene literally edit by edit. Mm. I wrote it, I wrote it up. I wish I kept it in. I, I like it. I, I, well, I've gone back and looked at it. It was pretty good. Uh, so that's that's one that I cut that I probably cut uh, too impulsively. I see. Yeah. So, but there are some missing pieces out there. So. To... <laughs> <laughs> Hi, John. Here we are again. Yes. To you. Glad to be here. Thanks for having me again. Yeah. <laughs> what a pleasure. And I, I could start off this session with a, a little uh, a little lesson for all the boys and girls and grown-ups who might be watching this. <laughs> they might even measure in the double digits. And the lesson that I have is asking doesn't hurt. <laughs> and I could tell you this personally because the first time you and I got together, I just asked if it was like a possibility i suggested that i'd love to talk to you about stuff one day and, mm -hmm. and you were into it and you're like you're you're like i'm always down to talk about twin peaks and then uh <laughs> very true I, said I wanted to i wanted to see you and john bernardi have a conversation that was like the one i really wanted to see and then i said uh well, if no one else will do it i'll host and and then this time i said um John, you once told me about some missing pieces from your <laughs> book, Ominous Whoosh. And I said, I, can I see one of those? Can I just see, can I just see the scene at the breakfast table, please? And you were kind enough to say, yeah, I got, I got that one and a few more. So I'm lucky enough to get access to some of the pieces that were cut <laughs> from your book. Oh. So we're going to talk about that and maybe a couple other things tonight, if that's cool. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I'm glad you think you're lucky to be able to look at them. I, uh, I guess what happened was um, I hadn't looked at them in a long time. And then you, you had asked about one and I looked at it and I, I had a file of deleted hmm. sections and pieces and some were incomplete. And I started to look at a few of them again, which I hadn't looked at probably in some cases, maybe a year or certainly six months for sure. Well, no, it would have to be over six months. But anyway, probably a year. Mm -hmm. um, and I thought, oh, wow, you know, I kind of wish I'd put that in the book. Or, oh, that was a good idea. I didn't get to pursue it or um, wh whatever. We could talk about it. But um, that then I thought, well, maybe you want to look at a couple of others. So um, that's what we did. You got to see yeah. a few a few of the... the, the Short pieces that I didn't include in the in the book Ominous Whoosh, which is the book about Twin Peaks and Return. Yeah, and just just because I have a couple things conveniently nearby, uh, we've talked a bit about this one, which is uh, the Essential Wrapped in Plastic collection right. collection of work from that magazine that you co-founded, and you do quite a bit of work as a writer and editor and possibly curator. The Blue Rose Mag. Right. Here's, here's the newest one. And I, as you know, I'm a big fan of that book. What I like about it is it, it's, it's got so much information just as the show does. So there's no, there's no way for me to read it and remember everything that I read because it's, it's just, <laughs> just so packed, you know, and then every bit of information could potentially be a, a whole little rivulet of an idea. Um, so each time I come back to it, and this happened to me today because I was reading a bit earlier, it's kind of like coming back to the show uh, where it's enjoyable and it's new. It's familiar and new at the same time, you know, and everybody has their favorite like episodes or parts in the Twin Peaks series. And uh, so each chapter or each section is sort of like a different part of that larger series. And I wasn't planning on asking you this, but do you have any favorite or least favorite parts from ominous wish oh from from uh, <laughs> from the book from the itself stuff, yeah from the stuff that actually got published um 
Well, it's funny. I, I, I was actually, I think I was asked this question. I was up in uh, Snoqualmie about a month ago now. I think it was a month ago today, in fact. Um, we're yeah, doing this on the 24th. 24th. Yeah. Um, yeah, somebody asked me about that, or similar question anyway. Uh, well, you know, there were a few things that I felt pretty good about when um, I was writing. I felt like I had a solid foundation underneath me. The Laura Palmer theory that I have about her revised role in the narrative and what her function is. Um, uh, and, and because Lynch has been fascinated with that character and Lynch's own interest in Hindu theology, yeah. uh, had a chapter about Laura sort of at the core of the story. So I'm very happy with that chapter. Uh, I'm happy with my analysis of Audrey and what Audrey's uh, story is about, um, sort of a pocket story within The Return. So I'm really happy with that. And uh, yeah, I mean, I guess in terms of theories and in terms of how well I think I got at them, those two stand out. I feel really good about chapter 18 as well. Yeah. Or I should say the chapter about part 18, mm -hmm. because that's a tough one. And it just felt really good while I was writing it. And I think we'll may get to some of talking about that because as I was writing that last part, it really challenged me about some of the things I had written about in earlier parts. And that's why some of the pieces are gone. Or I, I took out or changed some of the earlier parts of the book because I felt... Um, like chapter 18 was working for me pretty well or the chapter about part 18. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And, and that's what I reread today, 17 and 18 or, or those two chapters. Yeah. Oh, okay. Uh, good. Great. Just out of curiosity, do you have any least episodes of Twin Peaks, like the entire, at least favorite episodes of the entire series or just a few that jump out as maybe not your favorites? The entire series from, yeah. from the pilot all the way through? <laughs> yeah, just anything that's jumping to mind or that it's like notoriously you're not thrilled with. Well, sure. And I mean, this is kind of a, um, this is kind of a common answer, I think. And I'm, a, I'm somewhat hesitant too, um, to be too critical of, of it. I, but there's a second season slump. That's what I call it. Uh, in the second season of Twin Peaks, um, Lynch and Frost are not as involved. Mm -hmm. Frost, maybe even less than Lynch. And uh, Harley Payton has the uh, very difficult job of managing this extremely complicated show. Mm -hmm. And I think that uh, I don't I don't think anyone is at fault. I just think the show, because a network was demanding a show with so many you know, and had so many characters and so many storylines. Mm -hmm. and, and I think it just I. Personally, I really think it, it, and Lynch believes this too, it kind of loses its way. It gets kind of pedestrian. And um, I don't, I, I don't think about those parts of it. Yeah. Uh, That's so. another question. It's another question I wasn't really planning to ask. But I, when I was thinking of this book as a large project filled with many different little pieces, are there any pieces of this that are like your least favorite? When I was writing it, I, I, I've, told, I've told you this and other people this before. Mm -hmm. I, mean, I was writing about everything that was happening. My original idea was I was going to write ev about every scene. And I was doing that. And I got all the way through part four. And I was reading it. I was really pretty depressed because it was mm -hmm. boring. It, it, mm -hmm. it, you know, because, because it is just boring to read about every single thing that happens and you want to add something of value to what you're talking about to just describe it. It's boring. So, yeah. so I couldn't find, I got into part five and part five stymied me because I was not going to, I was going to try to jazz it up. I was going to okay. try to make it more readable. And um, I still think part five has, I, it got revised a lot, but it still has this kind of, feel to it where I, I feel like I was trying too hard in part five. Mm, okay. I, 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 so I don't know. Um, it's nothing about the part itself. It was about me and finding my way about, you know, what am I, what am I providing to the reader? Um, 
why would anyone want to read this? And so I was struggling there. So I, I think it's better than it was, certainly better than it was in the early drafts. Mm. I may have given you deleted material, but I did not give you early drafts. Yeah. <laughs> those are not, those are never going to come out. <laughs> That'll be next time. <laughs> That's it, that'd be tough. <laughs> when, when I have, um, oh, by the way, I, I also, maybe last week or a couple of days, I don't remember, but I watched little clips from the first time you and I chatted, and that was probably, I don't know, maybe six months ago. And at the very end of that, you said you said to me, you're like, Anthony, I don't know if you realize this, but uh, but there are like not as many people as into this world as you might think there are. And right. You're like, <laughs> first of all, people who are into the show. First of all, uh -huh. second of all, people who are still into the show. Mm -hmm. Third of all, people who were into the show and still like the return. And then people who like to talk about it. And then people who like to read about it the people who like to talk about what they what they've read about it and then you're like people who actually like to write about it you know it's a it's a shrinking number so it gets it does it, it gets, gets very 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 small um but you know still there are people who are enthused about it and and even if they never read the book i still think maybe they occasionally listen to a podcast or or something yeah. like this and get a little something maybe that will that will you give them some new thoughts about it which is great yeah but then there's then there's like the rest of us who <laughs> right who, who can't <laughs> and, ever stop thinking about it <laughs> yeah for, for whatever reason it has its hooks and has has anybody who's involved in the show in any way whether whether uh like actors or crew or writers or whatnot has anybody contacted you to let you know that they've read a piece of your work, be it the new stuff, the magazine stuff, heard, heard you talk somewhere or like anything like that? Uh, not the new stuff. Um, uh, you know, uh, I, I haven't sent it to anyone either. I, I, because the new book is really my analysis of it, I don't want to impose that on anyone. And so right. I wouldn't, you know, think about, sending to Mark Frost, what's he going to do if, if Mark, I mean, I could, I, I've got his address. I could send it to him. Yeah. Uh, I sent him the first book, but the first book was so much of the material from the magazine, which we all, we sent him every issue of that right. as they came out. Um, you know, but I, I wouldn't expect him to read my book and yeah. I'm sure my interpretation is differs from his. So I, I don't know. And he probably feels like he's done with it too. Um, so the, the the short answer is no. No one no one has uh, from the new book. Uh, now from the magazine, uh, yeah, we we did get uh, Harley Payton. I mentioned before, uh, he would comment on on articles that we wrote. Um, I, I I realized sometimes I was being critical of Harley Payton, and and he comment on it, mm -hmm. and I I felt really bad about that because I. I, I shouldn't assign, well, I, I didn't directly assign, you know, um, a blame or anything to anyone, but I commented on the second season and it was weak and he wrote a, a very generous letter and said, oh, that's my fault, something like that. And I realized it's not, it, that's not true. And I didn't mean to yes. imply that at all. He is a hero, if anything, Harley Payton is, of um, up Twin Peaks. Um but yeah, he, he commented on stuff that we wrote. And I think um, Mark Frost and, and David Lynch both were somewhat aware of it. They, they certainly Frost, um, but, but nothing too, too direct, nothing too direct about, about it. Um, I, I, you know, I, I've shared this story before, but I've, I've had <clears throat> actors uh, that we interviewed now 20, 25 years ago. I've encountered them again uh, and they remember the magazine and they say, I have, I still have that magazine. So yeah. uh, the magazine made an impression, which is a, which is a great thing. Yeah. Cool. Um, yeah. I've seen, I've seen a couple uh, cast members talk about reading and enjoying the new book. So that's pretty cool. You have. I have. Yeah. Uh, well, I, you know, I should, I should say that George Griffith, mm -hmm. uh, I forgot about I forgot about that. I mean, that's awful that I did because I just spent time with George Griffith a month ago. He and his girlfriend read the book as they rewatched the show, and they both were extremely complimentary about the book, which was wonderful to me to have a cast member 
uh, appreciate the work that I wrote uh, yeah. about his work. So, uh, so you know, he t he told me that in person. He, he didn't, you know, he didn't correspond with me, but he he did read it and and, and liked it. But I, I haven't heard anyone else. There was somebody else, maybe, <laughs> or was it George Griffith that you? Yes, yeah, I, I I'm almost certain that Mary Reber has read at least. Oh. Uh huh. Sure. She, she's she's super cool as far as in, interacting with yes fan community Very and being a fan so. herself. Well, I, I know George is a huge fan of the show, like and always has been. And uh, yes, as, as somebody who's such a good writer because he he I don't know much of his work behind beyond his movie from the head, which is really a killer movie. But as somebody right. who's had a craft, that's pretty that's pretty nice praise to get it from him too. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I, I was thrilled that he. It was funny. I posted a picture on Twitter of um, the the proofreader's draft I got of the book when it first got it. It wasn't even out yet. Yeah. And he he messaged me right away. Like I mean, I think within an hour. And he said, "Can I get a copy of that book?" Yeah. I'm like George, I don't. I only have one copy. <laughs> so you I'll can't have it. <laughs> as soon as it's done. Yeah. And so. Um, uh, he was eager to get it, which was which was very nice. Yeah, that is fantastic. W what I have noticed looking through some of the cut scenes or the cut pieces that you shared with me, the the missing pieces from um, <laughs> Bush, um, I'd say they fall into a couple different categories. And then you tell me if you agree or not. So I would say there are um, categories that you felt might have detracted from the pace of the book, possibly. Mm -hmm. Maybe some things that. And I'm not really sure. Maybe that contradicted or complicated some of your like theory work, perhaps. For sure. Uh, yeah. What other categories would you say of cuts? Um, I think you got really the main thing mm -hmm. is that um, there were pieces that I wrote uh, that, and I've talked about this before too. Is I are writing my way through something. And a feeling sometimes like I had a theory and then realizing after I had actually even honed the writing that the theory wasn't working or it contradicted. And so it, and I ended up deleting it because, you know, what, what val there's no value to it. Um, uh, but almost everything does fall under the, the overall reason is, well, th again, there are a few that just don't work. They don't work and so they don't belong. But um, there are a great many pieces that had value to them, I think, mm -hmm. but they were diversions. They were taking me down. I, I, I could have potentially written another essay mm -hmm. that would have fit in between, you know, chapters about parts and, and then uh, and then possibly uh, you know, expanded upon those ideas. I think I was probably getting a little burned out, a little tired, and didn't want to do another essay. Mm -hmm. uh, but there were parts that I thought had value that were interrupting, especially when like something in part 18. I mean, you got to keep moving in part 18, and part 18 was tricky. Uh, and so uh, I took some, some parts out because it just seemed like it was a detour. And we need, and then I'd have to get back and keep the momentum going of what we're talking about. So, I I took them out for that reason. Yeah, if there was a third category, I might say things you overzealously cut or too impulsively cut, perhaps because there's there's plenty of good stuff here that could have really stayed in the book, in my opinion. But I well, know, I mean, I'm sure you had a page limit in mind, but I mean, some of this <laughs> stuff is. is Worthy. Yeah, there was no page limit. I think you're you're probably right. I probably did cut some things that um, if I'd given myself another month and come back and looked, it would have fit fine. But but um, it, it felt in the moment like it was getting in the way of. I didn't want to bog people down too much. Yeah, and decisions so, decisions need to be made. <laughs> you know. Yeah, yeah. So, so I, I want to start with one of the scenes, if that's okay. Uh, sure. Then you can tell me what type of cut, or maybe why you think you cut it. Okay. Um, so I'm not I'm not going to read everything, but I'm just going to read a couple sentences from this passage. And uh, one of the things you wrote was, "We don't know what conversation Andy is talking about. 
The line becomes more noticeable when, after Mr. C enters the, the uh, sheriff's station, a surprised Lucy says the same thing that Andy just said. Agent Cooper, we were just talking about you. And then a, a comment just a moment later, you said a Lucy and Andy rewrite the reality that they inhabit. So I don't know if you want to talk about that at all. Oh, yeah. Yeah. And so I had already been talking about Lucy and Andy and their curious roles in the storyline mm -hmm. in earlier chapters. Certainly, I think in a way they almost make um, um, of <laughs> what's their what uh, what's their son's name? Um I can't believe I'm I'm drawing a blank. That I get put on the spot. Yeah, no, I can't that's remember her name. I, I'm doing, I'm um, playing Marlon Brando, but that's not his uh, name. Right, uh, <laughs> Michael so, Sarah. That's not his name. Wally. Right, Wally. Um, Wally. Um, <laughs> Wally. Yeah. Right, Wally. Uh, they they seem to almost ma make him man. If you know, he kind of comes out of the blue, hmm. and that's sort of the beginning. And there's a, there's the scene where we could dismiss it. I write about this in the book. It's in the book. <laughs> We could dismiss it, but we shouldn't necessarily where Lucy is saying, is it about the bunny, the chocolate bunnies? It's, it's a nonsensical scene. It seems like it's silly. And then Hawk at the end says, wait a minute, is it about the bunny? Which sounds like the punchline. But I write about this is that Lucy is somehow she seems to be aware of observer effect or, or not aware of it, but contemplating it and and. She maybe inadvertently is shaping the reality around her. She talks later about the clock stopping, and it's almost as if time actually stopped for them. There's some very fascinating things about Lucy and Andy. And Lucy and Andy, of course, are the heroes of the story, essentially. Um, Andy is the one selected by the firemen. Lucy's the one who stops Mr. C. They're really crucial characters, and there's clues about how important they are and maybe why they're important early in, and I write about that. I really should make this an essay, because the more I write talking to you about <laughs> it right now, the more I like this idea. And so as I was writing part 18, it was fascinating to me that Andy says, uh, when he sees Mr. C and he thinks it's Agent Cooper, he says, we were just talking about you. But that scene doesn't appear. We never see the scene Andy's talking about uh, uh, when, you know, where did they, were they just talking about them? So it, it happens off screen. And you might dismiss it because it's just this off one offline, you know, that's how Andy greeted Cooper again. But then Lucy says it again yeah. when they come in and which to me indicates there was import to the idea that they were talking about Cooper. And I wanted to explore that. And I started to, because what are they doing? It's almost as if they are, I think I write something about they are beacons that bring Cooper and Mr. C to them in a way. Like they, they are, you know, vital to bringing them together. And I think there's some possibility there. Now, as, and I read that when I sent you the material. I thought, wow, that's just, there's a lot of good stuff about that <laughs> curious comment about what they were talking about and why did that, why does Lynch repeat the line? Have them, you know, emphasize this absent conversation. There's imp import there. Hmm. I deleted it because there's a momentum going on in that chapter too. Cooper's coming. There's, there's stress is building. Uh, there, this big climax is about to happen. I guess it's part 17. I keep saying part 18. Um, but still, part 17. I mean, there's just so much. And um, I didn't want to get bogged down on that detour. And so I took it out. And in retrospect, there was an essay there. There was something of value to write about Lucy and Andy. Uh, but by that time, I, I probably was like, well get through this now you're at 17 and 18 and they are going to be their own difficult chores and so i took that lucy and andy part out yeah and you didn't want to do like a half page footnote at the bottom like a, like, like a, <laughs> uh, a style right thing. i mean i yeah. i i could have done that too and i thought about it but then i thought well that's not doing it justice either if i mm -hmm. if i if i just throw it in there like that it's not mm -hmm. we, I, I guess maybe it might have had some value people would have thought about it 
yeah. but I wouldn't have necessarily been providing anything, you know, and I wasn't expanding on it. So that's why I took it out. But I, again, the more I think about it, the more I think that is, that's something of value and it's worth exploring. Well, since you just said that, I'll, I'm going to ask a question from my classroom that I like to ask. And I would say, let's just focus on Lucy just for a moment. And uh, what function or functions, plural, do you think Lucy serves in this show? You could go to that scene, but maybe in this show in general. Uh, well, Lucy and Andy both are and I think I talk about this in the book, they're pure mm -hmm. characters. They, they've come to accept who they are and they don't, they're not getting in the way of themselves. So many characters in the return, the barriers to their happiness or their progression in life is themselves. They're hung up on the past or they're hung up on something. Uh, Lucy and Andy seem to have gotten over that. They, or, or if they ever had that to begin with, I don't know, but they are people who are content. And so they are, they are kind of like functional Dougies, <laughs> you know, they, they are good people. And so I think that is why they are heroic. Uh, they're heroic, even though, I mean, obviously Lucy pulls the trigger. So there's a big action, but they're heroic because just because of who they are, it, you know, they just, it's the common man is the hero. It's not the superhero. So I think that that may be. So the primary. Where I go. Okay, so the primary function might be uh, they that they display the power of the common man, and maybe that's according. I, I would say, say it better than I can. Uh, well, I don't know. I mean, the primary function I would say is that they exemplify mm -hmm. um, the value of knowing who you are being content with who you are it's enough if you if you because i think we we strive sometimes too much for something that I, you know i wouldn't say that you know there are things that are out of our reach of course you know you want that optimism of you can do anything you want yeah um but i think there's a great value to know who you are too um because <laughs> order, um, ordered the cheese sub i did <laughs> he's a He's so pleased. Oh, yeah, right. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah. Well, and I talk a little bit about that, too, in the book, um, oh, because the indication there is that Andy's a vegetarian and he won't hurt anyone. He won't even hurt mm -hmm. an animal for his own sustenance. So he's going to have just the cheese sandwich. But um, um, anyway, I, 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 would, I would say that they, um, because they're not, fighting against themselves they can achieve anything they want so if you you can get anything you want but you sort of do it passively if that makes any sense yeah that's interesting <clears throat> um the um i have a couple lines bolded from like the next segment and uh <laughs> one of them is in this timeless realm dale cooper is endlessly vexed by laura palmer and as his mind finally ventures into the world after 25 years in limbo the mystery of Laura Palmer consumes him. I'm going to say just two sentences as I skip down a bit. Uh, Cooper came to recognize that powerful forces of good and evil orbited the locus of Laura's life. And I'm going to drop down a bit. He intuited that Laura was the answer to a universal riddle, and he was compelled to investigate further to unlock the secret that was Laura Palmer. To do more than simply find her, he wanted to decrypt her. He wanted to crack the Laura code. Um, and then and then a little bit later, it says, it did not end that well. <laughs> and I have a little note there, like, well, actually, I'll, I'll save off. I'll save my note for now. But do, do you remember that passage? Um, what you were thinking while writing it? Why you cut it? Yeah, for sure. So um, that is a remnant of my, er well, I should say my earliest, but my or my main original thesis hmm. was what is and i think we all you know start to think this that, that you know, cooper's going to go save laura that's what he does at the end right he he goes back in time well uh, ostensibly he goes back in time to save her and there's seems to be 
this storyline, I think we all assume that he his goal is to save Laura. And I started writing the book with that in mind. And I wrote about, you know, why does Laura fascinate Cooper? Or what is it about Cooper? And I, I came up with the idea that whatever Laura knows, Cooper wants to know. That Cooper's searching for a secret of the universe and he thinks Laura has it. And so, and, and all that, it's, it's a valid theory, I think. And so I, I started writing the book and that, that was, I was setting the stage of my exploration of the return with, with those paragraphs about Cooper's motivation. But I found as I went along, there were some things that contradicted that. Now, I, I don't know why for, you know, we could be, it, it could be that Frost and Lynch were working at odds that Frost sort of saw Cooper one way and Lynch saw Cooper another way. And then you got these mix of motivations. And so, so it kind of, in some ways, it, it complicates the character of Dale Cooper. Who is he and why is he behaving the way he is? Um, so... So that was in place for a long time. And it wasn't until I got further into my exploration of the story that I started to see uh, Cooper differently, hmm. that uh, Cooper uh, wasn't so much trying to save Laura. He wasn't because she was some secret that he wanted to know. I started to see Cooper, because that's a very noble thing, I think, and I, I think Frost might agree with that in the David Bushman book. He talks about some of this, and I think then Cooper is portrayed, as we all want him to be, I think, as a heroic character who wants to do right, and he he is going to try to figure out who Laura is and, and, and you know, explore, explore all that. But as I got further into the story, I started to see Cooper as more of a flawed char uh, character. And um, that started to become a stronger approach for me for, for the character of Dale Cooper. And then there's a scene in, uh, I think it's in part two, where Cooper, you know, says to, to Laura, the, what appears to be Laura Palmer sitting with him in the red room. And he says, Laura Palmer is dead. Yeah. And I started to think about that and thought, well, if Cooper thinks Laura Palmer is dead, then he's sort of done with her. So if he's done with her, then all that I've written about in this mm. part that you just quoted and, and I, and, you know, I had expanded upon it and it doesn't work. And so if he thinks she's dead, then what's happening with Cooper? And then I started to see, oh, well, maybe Cooper thinks he's a superhero that he can fix all wrongs. Mm -hmm. And um, it, it was more about him and his own flaws than about him trying to explore the, war, the universe and explore Laura Palmer. So it's, it's an example really of me starting with one thesis and then finding as I went further into the book that I, I didn't feel like I could support the thesis later. So I ended up deleting that and then really rewriting a whole new introduction, which had to do with the fireman, mm -hmm. the fireman giving Cooper a mission that he had to go on and Cooper having to be rehabilitated before he could really do it. But Cooper never quite getting that he has to be more like Lucy and Andy, which we were talking about, mm -hmm. than this impossible superhero that he thinks he is. And that felt better for me. And that's why I went with the book. But I think this section you could you, you really could make an argument and you could pull it all the way through and talk about the mystery of laura palmer and why laura palmer um haunts dale cooper i have so. yeah that, that's <laughs> extremely interesting and and i didn't realize that while i was reading this so that's cool so i want to go in two directions but uh, but you brought the fireman up and what's interesting is if i'm correct according to what i was reading <laughs> The fireman was likely kind of the fireman scene at the beginning was kind of likely created later, so maybe even toward the end of the filming, perhaps, or toward the end of the writing. Uh, and I'm not sure if that's true or not, but it sounds like 
if it is true, it's very interesting because you had a similar experience as a writer of this book where where you basically had to redo the beginning to to make to make it make more sense with the ending of your book. Yeah, I, I can't say for sure. I'm not sure anyone no. knows for sure what the evolution of the firemen's scenes and roles were, but there is some footage in the making of documentaries that are in the big, you know, A to Z box set. Mm -hmm behind the scenes in Twin Peaks. And uh, Carol Strykin, who plays uh, the giant slash the fireman, is with Cooper in the Red Room. Mm. And there are, and he's practicing his lines. And you can hear what some of his dialogue was going to be. And he was going to appear to Cooper in the Red Room, which is totally, doesn't make really a lot of sense if he'd already been envisioned as this figure that was going to be in this black and white, otherworldly realm that begins the story and so i suspect that lynch was reworking some of the ending of the story the richard and linda elements what was happening with cooper at the very end and he felt like again i'm oversimplifying it i think lynch did have a an overall structure in mind and he knew what he wanted to do but I think it's quite, it's possible, it's possible that he re-envisioned this fireman scene and added it later and took the one out that I think they actually filmed that was the fireman in the red room. And so, uh, so anyway, I'm not sure exactly where your question, what your question was, but I, but yeah, I think I, I, that the fireman's role was, was maybe not entirely changed, but it was slightly revised, uh, we do know Kyle McLaughlin has said that there were scenes that he had as Dougie yeah. uh, in, interacting with the one our man, Phil mm -hmm. Gerard, that were a little more lucid. And right. those scenes were all taken out, too. So, so when Lynch was filming, he had an idea in mind. But when he was editing, he may have changed it a little bit. And so we have to work with what the final product is. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Do you think there's any chance that that was meant to be the giant in the red room rather than the fireman? Um, my, that's a good question. That's a good question. I which which I, would it, which would imply that the fireman was really sort of conceptualized like later in the process. Possibly. Yeah, I think when you see him in those behind the scenes footage, he is wearing that red. Yeah. Well, it's red, but we don't know it's red in the black and white scenes. That mm -hmm. smoking jacket. True. So they may have been thinking of him with a slightly different identity yeah. even then. But um but I think that evolved. Yeah. So um I I hate to I hate to ask this now, but I, it's on my <laughs> mind. But when when Laura says uh you know I I'm dead and yet I live. Um yeah. is that some is that some sort of reference to uh, like a superposition, which is something I don't know really much about is the quantum physics idea. And I'm not sure if you want to go down that road yet, or is that closer to like a Easter, Easter Sunday type <laughs> or, or neither? Uh, I, I hadn't thought about the, uh, the quantum physics thing. That's mm -hmm. possible. And that's something worth considering. Um, for me, I thought the line was somewhat explicit. Uh, that she's telling Cooper, I'm dead and yet I live. And so, and I do talk about this in, in the in the final book, um, you know, she's signaling to Cooper that she's alive. Now, alive as in what form, and alive as, as what? Alive as just a, a, a memory, you know, that motivates people. That's, that's, you know, that's one way of interpreting it, I suppose. Um, but I kind of took it literally, I'm dead and yet I live. Um, which I think is somewhat of a trigger there for Cooper to think, well, okay, I thought you were dead and now you're alive. And so, you know, what does that mean? And, um, and then, and then Leland says, find Laura. He, he, so he sort of implicitly confirms that she must be alive somewhere. And so, um, mm. so I, I, I kind of took it to be a, a signal that an aspect of Laura Palmer is out there, if not Laura Palmer herself, 
and that she still has something that she has to do and Cooper has to go, he has to go find her. Yeah, that's that's great. I'm I'm trying to stay disciplined and not go down the uh, Leland find Laura moment because I'm, I'm I'm wondering to what extent, if any, is like Leland in cahoots with the firemen or something like that because because it seems like when he says to find Laura, it, the way Cooper reacts, it seems as if almost like his his programming uh, sort of like re kicks in. But but if I think. If we could talk about that later unless you want to comment on it now. Well, I, I would only say that we have so little of Leland. Yeah. We have we have him appear twice and he says the same thing twice. Uh it's still it, there's still a lot of value there. There's still a lot of I mean, I've talked about it in the book, but it, it it's to to um draw the conclusion that he might be in alliance with the fire, there's just not enough to yeah. there's not enough there. So I would say, given the performance we get from Ray Wise and the way Leland appears, he's still looking for some. He he maybe he redemption or he mm. he feels like if he can still do something to make up for what he did in the past, then you know maybe he can you know, find some level of redemption. So he's imploring Cooper to find Laura because Laura still has this important thing to do. And maybe Leland essentially got in the way of that and, mm -hmm. and pr almost prevented it from happening. So you see, there's a sort of a different story going on now because Laura still has something to do, I, I would argue. And so you see this imploring Leland, I think. So, um, Okay, I think we are technically sound, uh, technologically sound now uh, after yeah. the break. So I'm going to read something that was apparently is a footnote that was cut. And yeah. this is about Twin Peaks uh, as a TV show. And you wrote, this, this was not death in the abstract, the machinations of plot. This was the raw, painful termination of life, love, potential. Those around Laura Palmer realized her death forever changed the reality in which they lived. Twin Peaks, in turn, was asking us to change the way we watch TV. And you want to talk about that passage a little bit? Yeah, I like that. It's good. Mm -hmm. uh, it was a footnote. Um, and um, I, I, I deleted it for two reasons. One, I didn't want to get bogged down on the old show. Not bogged down, but I didn't want to. Mm -hmm divert time into talking about the original show because this wasn't about that. The book is about the new show. Even though, obviously, I had to talk about the old show in other places because it's connected and you've got to talk about it. But this comment that you just read was specifically about that show and about how it impacted audiences and how... And I felt, well, okay. And then also, I think that observation had been made before, too. So... Uh, I felt like, okay, it might be repetitive. Somebody, you know, other people have, have made that comment and and I don't need to talk about the old show. I've done that for 13 years in a magazine. <laughs> so I, I just cut it for that reason. Fair. Plain and simple. I, 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 it sounds good when you read it. I like it. It sounds pretty good. Okay. So, uh, <laughs> oh, well. <laughs> yeah, I was wondering what, the, what that experience is like hearing some of these passages. And here's another one, okay? And uh, this one... This one is not a repeat of the old stuff. And this one is not maybe something you're going to hear elsewhere. So you wrote right. uh, in a different passage, you wrote, the fireman says to Cooper, listen to the sounds. They are in our house now. These poetic lines, ambiguous though they may be, resemble a phrase from the Hindu text, the Rig Veda, which states, far, far away, the indweller of the house sees the self reverberating. And then, well, I'll, I'll cut it there. And then you go on to talk a little bit about uh, Martha Nockinson's book, mm -hmm. bit about uh, the the Lynch Foundation, etc. But right. why did this part get cut? Uh, boy, this part, I felt so about this. And I really like this uh, stuff. And um, because it ties into the Hindu material, and it seems to explain the overall thesis that I was, I still maintain in the book is that Cooper is seeing the world the way 
he sees it. We're or we're seeing we're seeing Cooper's version of the world, but everyone sees the world their own way. I go into that in some detail, and I won't go over it a lot again here. But this this comment from the fireman really does resemble this comment from the Hindu text, which Lynch himself specifically mentions to Martha Nockhamson in one of her books. So this quote is, is strong in Lynch's mind. Mm. Then you have the firemen say something very much like it. And then you, it seems to fit so well with the idea of Cooper being an observing presence. It all works. I cut it because, um, because there was so much other material in that chapter that talked about the same thing. Okay. And I just felt like either I was over explaining it. I had another great example here, you know, and look at this. Or I was I was op explaining it so much to the point I was going to start confusing you again. Mm. You know, that, oh, now there's another Hindu quote and Lynch made it to Martha Nockhamson. And, it, you know, and so it it was almost like it was. A super saturated solution uh, in in that chapter that if you tapped it the wrong way, the whole thing was going to solidify, and I mean that in a bad way. That mm. it wasn't going to be a, there wasn't going to be any fluidity anymore to the chapter. It was just going to be this block of text. And so, as much as I liked it, and I think it's gr of great value interpreting the fireman's quote, mapping it to that. Hindu quote that Lynch himself is so um, uh, aware of that he can quote it to Martha Nockhamson. Uh, I think it supports my argument. Uh, and I wanted to keep it. It stayed in for a long time. It moved around. It was in a later chapter. It's just, it's a lot of heavy stuff, you know, and that chapter, that comes from the chapter where I'm talking about or the early chapters where I'm trying to set up my thesis of this being, we're watching something the way Cooper's seeing it. Yeah. Um, and again, I'd already used other examples and I felt like you, you can overwrite it and you can overcomplicate it, even though it's beautiful and perfect. <laughs> and so that's why I cut it. And um, I, I didn't want to cut it. I didn't want to cut it uh, because I thought it was so valuable. I cut it because uh, it was almost like it was just just so much information. Uh, and I, I, I don't know if I'm explaining this well, but... Yeah, it's heavy. Uh, it, it, it's heavy, it's dense, it, it succeeds. Well, I wasn't sure I was up to the task of keeping it buoyant enough to to convey it uh, maybe it was getting in the way and so uh, that's why mm, i got it mm, a lot of a lot of answer there but anyway no 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 that's you can see i'm still struggling with it <laughs> well and also one of my questions was you know were any of these cut passages painful or emotional or different but, and i would say this one might have been yeah this this was something i had early on and i felt i still feel i i mean i still feel strongly that the fireman's quote is supported by hindu philosophy and it fits um mm -hmm. i think maybe this surfaced in the blue rose in another essay uh or an earlier draft of one of the chapters so it it's out there i i put it out there to the four readers who read the blue rose magazine uh but i would certainly if i were to write another essay you know explore Twin Peaks The Return again, which I, I might, I would come at this because I think this might also tie into some of the quantum physics ideas yeah. uh, that Lynch is vaguely interested in. And this, this might fit in with that. And, and so I don't know if you were going to get into the quantum stuff, but I will say I had quantum ideas I wanted to put in there and that was another example of it just being so much dense information that I'd already, I think I felt, well, I successfully have explained my theory. And, um, you know, I'm trying to think of the right analogy here. Sometimes less is more. Yeah. 
you know, I, I took it out. Yeah, that's very interesting to hear all of this just from like a crafting, like a writerly crafter point of view, because you could have really good content and you you use the word buoyant, which was really the word that jumped out the most. And that's just interesting to to see somebody pulling out from the, you know, from the nitty gritty, from the paragraph level idea, from the page level idea, being able to zoom out enough to say, okay, how does this fall into the paragraph? You know, how is this going to affect the the fluency and the flow of this 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 scene that I'm discussing or this paragraph? And then to really be able to zoom out and say, well, I have this text that's moving like this through, through the course of the whole book. And uh, it's it's just interesting as a, as a teacher, as a reader, just uh, even just as a listener to see a writer thinking along those ways, along those lines and you know, explaining himself like that. It's, it's cool. Yeah. It, you know, those things happen. Mm -hmm. you don't realize they're going to happen they are that you're there and you're struggling with it and sometimes when you're struggling with something like that sometimes the best answer is what if i take it out yeah then yeah. i obviously i'm not struggling with it anymore but <laughs> and am i damaging anything if i take it out and, and and in this case i felt like i wasn't damaging anything i was denying myself and a reader something really valuable but i wasn't damaging anything and so what do you do? I was like, because again, that section, I have to reference the Martha Knockamson quote. I have to reference David Lynch. I have to reference John Hagelin, who is uh, someone who works with Lynch at the Lynch Foundation. I had to put all this in there and, and help the reader through it. I wanted the reader to know that, but I didn't damage anything by taking it out, I don't think. So I took it out. Yeah. Plus, plus, you're also in the midst of talking about, um, I think, around this section, how how you were at least talking about how Cooper might be trying to decrypt or to to solve the Laura puzzle in some way, and how he was unable to do that. And uh, I, I wrote a little comment here. If if he was unable to decrypt her, do you feel like you were you were able to decrypt Cooper? Decrypt Cooper? Yeah. Um, uh, did yeah. You, did you I, feel I, like at some point, and I'm sorry to interrupt you, did you feel like yeah. at some point he's trying to decipher her and you're trying to, did you feel like you were trying to decipher him like almost simult simultaneously? I didn't, maybe I didn't really think about it in those terms until I got to part 16 and part 17. And then I, you know, I mean, it's just so exaggerated. They're so false Yeah. that I felt like at that point I was decrypting Cooper. Mm -hmm. I was getting who he was, who he thought he was. I felt pretty confident in it. And I mean, and, and there I did get into some references to uh, Mulholland Drive and other texts mm -hmm. that had talked about Mulholland Drive and the character of Betty and how Betty is an exaggerated, probably imaginary character. And, 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 and Cooper was following that pattern. And, uh, and I felt I was decrypting him there. And I felt pretty confident that at least – whether or not it fits late, you know, earlier, it certainly fits there that something is not right. Uh, and, um, and so, uh, you know, that, and, and that probably, <clears throat> I'm say probably I'm almost certainly impacted because you know, writing in 16 and 17, yeah, feeling like I've got it. Well, is anything in one and two and three contradicting that? Did I say something? that I went down a path that now I can't support it because I wrote that 18 months ago, you know, and now mm -hmm. I'm thinking a little differently. So that, that was the trickiest part of writing the book. I'd probably say is when you start to get a thesis that's maybe different than the one you began with, not the overall idea that it was Cooper's version of events was always there, mm -hmm. but, but why was it this? Why was he behaving this way? We, you know, those motivations, I started to see something different later on. And so I had to go back and remove material or rewrite it to strengthen those chapters, 17 and 18 chapters. So anyway, that's that's a trick. <laughs> did you ever for did you ever for a moment say, let me keep the stuff that doesn't fit? just to have a sort of like a counterpoint or like a refutation present within this larger argument? Were you ever like, or am I just like saying something that doesn't make sense? Like were you ever thinking no. those lines? 
Well, I did consider at one point putting appendices in the book where I would have these maybe unfinished pieces or, mm -hmm. you know, other ways of examining it or comment on that. I did, but I didn't want to do that. I, I had a vision for what I wanted the book to be. I didn't mm -hmm. want to have appendices. I wanted to end where it ends. I don't know if anyone's ever noticed or mentioned or no one's ever said anything to me, but the opening line. The very first line of the book is the is the last line of the book. Yeah, yeah, I mean, yeah. I did that on purpose, uh, and I knew I wanted it to start with a woman screams. That's the opening line, and I wanted it to end and end with a woman screams. And so I wasn't going to put appendices in. I wasn't going. I mean, I put a note from the author. Thank you, you know, so and so. Yeah. <laughs> but the text was done, and so. I thought about appendices, and then I was I wasn't going to do it, so I did. Put it in the book, but that was again a project. Mm -hmm. um, I, I did, you know, when I was getting into uh, those parts I was talking about with part sixteen and, and this exaggerated storyline, I did feel like it was important for me to address different interpretations and say, okay. If it's not this and it's all a dream, then what does it mean? If it's not all a dream, then it's really happening. What does it mean? And try to say, I don't, I can't buy this argument and I can't buy this argument. And mm. so if I can't buy those two, I'm staying with this one. And so I did in that part feel it was important for me to, to explore the reader's potential, you know, alternative takes on what was yeah. happening and at least say i i thought about it and you may be right but it doesn't work for me yeah so. yeah and that's that's super important and i think helpful um because wh whenever you can whenever you can match what somebody else is thinking even if it's just for a brief acknowledgement you're building rapport with that person so um there's something from from part one and I'm going to just read a couple random sentences. Cooper is confident, composed, aware. He calmly listens to the fireman impart his cryptic information and states, I understand. Then he vanishes as if venturing forth to complete an assignment, a mission given to him by the fireman. And then there's a little part here where you reference uh, Lynch's unmade film Garden Back which is where like there's an insect in some guy's attic, which was sort of like his mind. And then it goes, this confident Cooper, the one who willfully dematerializes after receiving his instructions is not the Cooper who will dominate most of the narrative. The return instead will focus on the Cooper left behind at the end of the original series, the one trapped in the red room. Um, yeah, so that's interesting. And there were some thoughts there that I never had myself. And this one didn't make the cut, so. Yeah, some of it did. The uh, instructions given by the fireman. Yeah, that's yeah, all yeah. I, I left that in. I think I was, um, the, the, some of that comment about this, we're not going to focus on this Cooper, we're going to focus on that Cooper. That was early stage me thinking, you know, this Cooper we're seeing with the fireman may be a later Cooper in the timeline. Mm -hmm. I was struggling with that, that maybe the Cooper we see with the fireman has, has gone through his story and, you know, is now rehabilitated or, or something. I think a lot of people did. A lot of people thought, well, where does that fireman scene take place? You know, I even wrote an essay in Blue Rose that it takes in part of me that, that, after Cooper leaves the sheriff's station, he goes to the fireman and gets that scene. And then he comes back to with Diane and Cole, which mm -hmm. I don't believe anymore. But um, and so, so some of what I wrote there was early, you know, attempts at figuring out who Cooper is in, the, in a moment and why he's why he's behaving the way he is. So I, I cut some of it because I don't think I could. I didn't really believe it anymore. Hmm. How about the part where he willfully dematerializes? Because for some reason, I always looked at that as him sort of being like zapped away or like, you know, like wherever the fireman was dematerializing him, so to speak. So I, uh, I still kind of think somewhat 
that that's the case because I think Cooper, uh, and I, I do write about this in, in you know the stuff that made it, is that Cooper thinks, oh, I can do this. I'm going to go fix this. I'm going to go do what you want. But yeah. he's not really doing it. The, the fireman's, that's why the fireman has insurance plans because Cooper's not necessarily the most reliable agent. Uh, and so... Um, so he's almost I, like, I, I, I understand. Yes, I just sort of thought like, okay, and he didn't even like, he did it prematurely, like he needed more information from the fireman. And he he said, well, okay, I'm going. And he too (laughs) impulsive, he went. And so uh, I thought, and I didn't write that, but now that I think about it, I should have, that maybe Cooper was jumping the gun, he was ready to go. And Mm -hmm. but that fits with the idea of Cooper thinking, well, I'm Cooper, the one and only. So I don't need any more information. You've told me what I need. I understand. I'm heading out. So that's why I wrote willfully. Do you think there will be interactive books at some point? I mean, and there might be now. Like, what I mean is, like, the book is a living thing. And then, you know, if you have these moments where you're like, damn, I wish I put that in, or you <laughs> actually could, or uh, I want to cut this, or things like that. You think that's a uh, will be? A- I think that it has happened actually with with eBooks. I know, in fact, that um, there was an example of a book. I think Neil Stevenson, the author Neil Stevenson, had written a book. Uh, he's a science fiction writer, and it, the Kindle version went out, and then alterations were made, and everyone who bought it it changed on their iPad or whatever. You know, they got a different version, which I'm somewhat. I, I don't like that idea that, I, <laughs> you know, the draft wasn't ready, then you shouldn't have published it. And so, um, but people revise their books all the time, a ver- you know, a revised version of this book comes out and it's got new notes and new thoughts. And sure. um, I, I don't think I do that. I, 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 it would be, I'd be hard pressed to do that because I think people have already spent the money on the book. And I don't want them to spend the money on 90% of the same thing they've already got again. I, I, I wouldn't, I wouldn't do that. I would write a new book. Uh, yeah. If I write another Twin Peaks book, it'll be a book of short observation essays, like some of the stuff that got deleted and maybe some other things. I I don't know if I have enough for a book, but mm. that's what it would be. And then you'd get, you know, I feel a little bit more like I'm asking you to pay money, but everything I'm giving you is new. <laughs> so I think I have a responsibility, yeah. you know, to the reader in that respect. Yeah. I, and I don't, I don't want to go down this topic, but I was just wondering sure. if, if there's if there are like you know you have the book, you have the digital book, and it almost you could almost it almost changes live like a Wikipedia type thing. As That's, long as the original material was still there, yeah, I, I think that might be a value. Is that oh you know a new kind of but it would have to be an electronic book, right? You know, and it would have yeah. a, a a new link where I rethought this, and I don't know how you what the economic structure of a book like that would be because. Right, right. What's the motivation? You've already bought the book. <laughs> and so now I have some new ideas. I'm going to give them to you for free, which yeah, I, I don't, I mean, there is a satisfaction in that, but if I'm going to really spend some time to write it. Yeah, exactly. Uh, you know, <laughs> um, do I just want to give it away? <laughs> I mean, yeah, yeah, yeah. I don't mean to sound like some, you know, you know, uh, cruel capitalist that's, you know, looking to, you know, anyway, I'm going off on it. Yeah, okay. You know, it, it's a strange, uh, it's a strange new world that we're in. I, I just like hearing you. Uh, I like hearing you even intimate the possibility of writing more about Twin Peaks. And and uh, John, our friend John Bernardi, I, I told him I was going to talk with you, and I asked him if he had any questions, and he he pretty much just said say hello. But his okay, only, his, only, his only question was, um, uh, what's capturing your attention, if anything, nowadays? as far as Twin Peaks goes? Oh, um, I, I don't know. I haven't thought a lot about it. I mean, um, I, I I look at everything, you know, John Bernard, he's got something, or if somebody, you know, there's stuff on Twitter, or I, there's something new, a new book comes out, some new books have come out. Mm-hmm. I peruse them. I haven't read deep into it because I'm still kind of coming off all the years I spent on it. So I know that there's a new book from Greg Olson coming out later this year about Twin Peaks The Return. I look forward to that. I'll probably read that whole thing straight through. And, uh, you know, 
there's going to be new work about Twin Peaks. There's got to be people out there who are still stimulated by it and want to write and, and analyze it. So um, I'm just, I guess I'm waiting for that. I, I'm looking, and the New England Empire Criterion came out. There's a new interview in there with Laura Dern and Colin McCaw. I haven't watched it. Yeah, probably watch it after we, we, we talk. Yeah. And uh, th those kinds of things. But cool. long answer for really no answer. <laughs> yeah, makes sense um did, did I, okay here's another one but dale cooper is a man out of time and then i'm going to skip a little bit no time has passed david lynch says while directing mm -hmm. kyle mclaughlin cooper is still in 1989 cooper was not just trapped in another place when he entered the red room he was trapped in another time and then i skip a little bit he is nothing but memory so my question is, why was this passage cut? Yeah, that's a good question. <laughs> um, I do, I think, I do address it in another place. Um, I'm pretty sure I, I talk about the no time has passed for yeah, you. Yeah, for sure. Uh, I think, and there's a lot of evidence, and I, I think I talk, I talk about it to some extent, that Cooper, he just sort of blinks into existence mm -hmm. that he's still got a, uh, he hasn't seen the progression of time, the 25 years. Um, there is some information that contradicts that. I was going to pursue, I actually thought for a while, well, that's why Lucy doesn't understand cell phones because they didn't exist when Cooper went into the red room. So he can't imagine someone talking on a cell phone either because he doesn't know what it is. But then later, people are talking on cell phones. So I I decided not to get too bogged down in the theory that everything we see is uh, uh, something that, you know, it would be anachronistic. Uh, and so I, I revised that. I took that out, and then I kind of redeveloped it, I think is probably what, what happened there. Yeah, that sounds accurate. Um, there's a passage about uh, Bill Hastings as a Kafka-esque character. Yeah. Perhaps similar to the protagonist in the trial. Um, yeah. You want to comment on that? Uh, well, there's so much Kafka, and I, I had, you know, I think Lynch wants us to think of Kafka because he puts two photos of Kafka yeah. in there. And we know that Lynch has talked about wanting to, first of all, we know Lynch has talked about how important Kafka was to him uh, and how he wanted to make the trial into a film. I think he wrote a script. Mm -hmm. So Kafka is an important element of Lynch's worldview and it finds its way into the return. And I do talk about it in lots of places and I felt like I might be overdoing it. I did cut some other Kafka stuff, little bits here and there. Mm -hmm. There were a few that seemed perfect, and I put them in. Um, and there was a few that I felt like, okay, I'm beating a dead horse. Yeah, we got it. He likes Kafka. This is a Kafka reference, and so I just I took it out. Got it. And, and it's interesting that Kafka is in the Hastings household. And and anybody who wants anybody who wants more of your thoughts on Kafka and Twin Peaks is there's a great episode from your podcast with Josh. The interactive yeah. pod podcast is an entire episode on Kafka. So, right. Yeah, that's pretty Yeah, cool. it just seemed like Bill Hastings was so much like a Kafka character. He, I in the in the passage that you were reading, there was more yeah. to it where he says, I don't know why I'm being accused of that. I don't know what I, you know, what happened. And that <laughs> seems to come straight from the trial where the character in the trial does not understand at all why he's being suddenly accused of something and, and has to go on trial. Uh, it's all a confusing world. And I mean, it just perfectly fits. I'm sure Lynch was thinking at least intuitively in that way. And um, I just, again, took it out probably for flow or again, oh, I didn't want to overdo all the Kafka. Yeah. So. Here's something I never thought of before, uh, a different passage. And you wrote, Bob is chaos personified. But when wielded by a superior mind, he can become, or he becomes a powerful tool. Mr. C uses this tool to further his ends. He orders Bob to disrupt the electrical systems of the Yankton Federal Prison. 
So that was neat. <laughs> it is neat, isn't it? Uh, <laughs> it? That's a tough, tough thing to get my arms around on mm. what Bob is and whether or not Bob is real or not, which is that goes all the way back to the original series. Is Bob real? Is he really a tool? Is he really a demon that possesses you? Or is he the mask you use to excuse your actions? And so I I struggled with how much I wanted to get too definitive on Bob. And I allude to the fact that Bob was probably, you know, the, the cause of the electrical disruption. But I don't, I, I toned it down a little. Okay. Uh, because for a while there, I was thinking of Bob as now Mr. C's familiar. But when I got into part 17 mm. and uh, I was talking about Bob there because it's so exaggerated, I felt like a better argument to make that speaks to the Cooper character is that Cooper does not want to acknowledge Mr. C. He does not, he turns his back to Mr. C. And if you think about it, I, this is in the book, so I won't go into too much detail. This is all there. Mm -hmm. I mean, Cooper, this is a flaw. I mean, Cooper, an aspect of Cooper did some horrendous things. And I think in those moments in 17, he's just sort of blaming it on Bob. And, and, and he's the one and only. He's not going to be tainted by this evil self. And so he never has to face the consequence that an aspect of himself could do this. It's unexplored in the return, but maybe deliberately because it's showing a flaw of Cooper. And for me, that was more valuable. It was more meaty than going down the Bob as a tool path. And I felt that was sort of non-Lynchian ultimately. So I cut and I toned down my interpretations of my earlier interpretations of Bob. Do you remember when Bob is, I'm sure you remember <laughs> when, when Bob is sort of writing the uh, experiments spew in part eight. Yes. Why sure. he, and then you get the eye contact, you get the Bob eye contact. Who's he looking at? Uh, well, of course they were using whatever footage they had of Frank Silva yeah, as Bob. Yeah, they didn't sure. have much, you know, to go on. Although it's it's powerful and it's effective, yeah. uh, um, but you know, I, um, I it could be it could literally be you know he's the evil that men do right he's looking at you mm -hmm. he's the evil that you could do if you weren't a balanced self you know and so because uh, Cooper ultimately is showing that he has this element of himself that can do these terrible things uh, and. What's stopping all of us from being Mr. C? Well, we have a good, we, we, I'm not professing this, but let's just explore it, you know, sure. in more general yeah. terms and maybe in the Twin Peaks terms is that we are balanced and, and Lynch has specifically talked about balance. We are balanced and if we're purely good, then we're Dougie, which is a great thing, but not a great thing because Dougie can't do anything. It's maybe the darker sides that allow us to act in the world. Mm. But acting unchecked leads to chaos and, and terrible, horrendous things. And so there has to be some balance. Um, and again, I, I'm not professing a philosophy here. I think it just it's, it's in the text. And, um, and so... Uh, um, I lost my train of thought a little bit. <laughs> Sorry to say, I, I think um, I know I was talking about Cooper. Uh, I think knowing, that, your, maybe knowing, maybe there's value in knowing your inner Mister C, and perhaps even being familiar with him. I think I well again I I'm, I referenced earlier that, mm -hmm. that Cooper doesn't acknowledge what happened with Mister C, and I think that's a flaw in him. I think. Ultimately, Cooper needs to say, I need to right the wrongs of this. Even though it wasn't me, it still was part of him, mm -hmm. right? I mean, it was. It's not, Mr. C is not a unique entity, an individual separate character. He is Dale Cooper. And so 
uh, that is not addressed. And again, I think deliberately so because Cooper's flawed in that respect. He is not going to accept or acknowledge that he could, some part of him could do that thing. And so uh, I, I, you know, that, that stuff that I wrote about in that part came much later. I added it in because I knew something, I knew something was missing. And I realized Oh, because Cooper isn't acknowledging uh, himself. I wasn't doing it and following Cooper along and realizing that's it. That's the problem here is that Cooper's not doing it. So I realized oh, I've got to talk about this because this speaks to why Cooper is flawed. And what's happening in that section is Cooper is projecting the perfect version of himself and a perfect version of himself can't have a Mr. C. So uh, these all ties into the Bob thing. This is where we, where I was going earlier. Um, and I think in some ways it's implicit that Cooper is just saying, oh, well, Bob, Bob, the devil made me, the devil made me do it. Bob was the one. And uh, that's an excuse. So uh, I think I only devote a few paragraphs to it in the final version of the book, um, which almost didn't exist. Those paragraphs almost didn't happen to begin with. Mm. It surely could be expanded upon and and explored further. Um, yeah, but so, those paragraphs leap leap off the page within the flow of that chapter. You know, good. The, the, yeah, they do. Um, it's interesting. Cooper does not get into the ring with with Bob. He just sort of observes what's happening the whole time. He really doesn't get his hands dirty at all. Um, but 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 not to get into that. There's another passage I'd like to read and. Uh, it says, after shooting Mr. C, Ray Monroe gets a glimpse of Bob and realizes that dark forces are at work. He tells Philip Jeffries, I saw something in Cooper. This may be the key to what this is all about. Ray is absolutely right. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, that's all you're going to read. <laughs> so, uh, I, I can continue more? if you want. Yeah, there is. Shop. Um... <laughs> Here, this might this might bring it back to you. Uh, okay. You said Ray, Ray is absolutely right. Bob is a critical component of the conflict at play in the return. Forces are targeting Bob. Some want him back in the black black lodge, while others want him to remain on the loose. And then it goes on for a little bit. Yeah. Okay. So this it really is all a lot of what I was just talking about was at, at a certain point I was treating Bob as maybe too much as a, a, an independent entity. Not to say that he isn't. It, that, and Twin Peaks is so tricky in this respect. And I, um, and there is no right answer. Uh, and that's part of, I think, the appeal of Twin Peaks is that we want to struggle with what is Bob? What is Bob? Is he, is he an independent evil entity? He's a demon that possesses you and makes you do bad things. Or is he the mask you put on when you don't want to acknowledge that you do bad things? Um, or is he both or you know and it, and so I was being too definitive there I say quite definitively he's the he's what it's all about and then I realized that's too I can't support that so I, I that's why I took that out I wanted to I wanted to talk about Bob I wanted to bring it up I wanted to more you know ask those questions rather than try to answer those questions because I can't answer those questions. <laughs> I don't think anyone can answer those questions. I think the value is to ask them and debate them. That has always been Twin Peaks. And we go all the way back to the original series. You know, maybe that's all that Bob is, the evil that men do. And, Co and Truman can't quite come to grips with what's happened and why could Leland have done this thing. And the show was bold in those days in 1990 and 1991 to even – bring these ideas up on network television, you know? Mm. And uh, and then Firewalk With Me complicates it even more because Firewalk With Me really kind of steers a little bit more to the idea that Bob is just um, maybe Laura's. She made Bob up. Uh, um, ha Harold Smith even says that to her. Bob's not real. He's assuming Laura has just masked Leland as Bob. And the film doesn't, explicitly come down on one side or another mm -hmm. so i can't come down on one side or another and in those chat in those pieces that you're reading i am kind of coming down on one side and i 
I uh, realized I couldn't do that. So yeah, it, it is interesting to hear the thinking behind why uh, certain very compelling passages were pulled. Um, here's here's another one that was pulled. Uh, this was in the casino. Um, a, a camera is pointed at Cooper, and Burns says to him, we're watching you. Cooper yeah. stares at the camera, and for a moment, we are reminded of a scene in Fire Walk With Me, where Cooper stared at a video camera in the hallway of the Philadelphia FBI offices. There, prompted by the memory of a dream, he seemingly departed from the normal flow of time. One version of himself remained in the hall, while another dot, 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 dot. Yeah, I like that part. <laughs> and uh, I think that came to me in the moment while I was writing it. I was studying. I studied every scene in such detail. I did think of Fire Walk With Me, and it was like, wow, this fits. And uh, I ultimately cut that just simply because I felt like I was going off on a tangent, you know. And could I put it as a footnote? Maybe um, when you read it to me, I see... I see value in it. I wish in some ways it had stayed in. That is that, you know, that was that section where it was like, you know, there's a lot of pieces being put in place to sort of create the foundation of the story that's to come. And so many things you can talk about. And I, I just cut that because I wanted to get Cooper to Janie, e, <laughs> you know, because uh, I had I had sections, you know, I had sections of everything that he did in the in the in the um, casino, and much longer section of when his friend comes up and the wife is there, and they talk about, oh, you live on Lancelot Court. Mm -hmm. I mean, the, all of that was written out, and then it's like a paragraph long, which doesn't sound like much to you. Uh, in the book, it's a line long. It's one line or one or two lines. It's just like he meets his friend who reminds him where he lives. In in the original version, it was he meets his friend, he's eating a hot dog, <laughs> he talks about this, then the wife comes up, and I'm like, you don't need to know that. We need to get to the key elements of the story of this character. And, and sometimes there were pieces that were interesting, like that camera scene that you just read, that probably would have been worth keeping in. So... Because I like that. <laughs> like when you read that, I'm like, that sounds pretty good. <laughs> <laughs> well, this this is a consolation prize. At least, at least, at least we got to share. Sure. So here's another, um, and it goes: Cooper's repeated use of the word "home" throughout the opening 15 minutes of this episode hints that the concept has taken root in his mind and perhaps has found meaning and import a meaning that could extend as far back as Fire Walk With Me. In a deleted scene near the end of that film, and one that is available on the Missing Pieces feature of the Complete Mystery Blu-ray, the arm tells Cooper, you are here and there's no place to go but home. So that was interesting to see that connection there. But this is another passage that got cut. Yeah, I think I probably, um, here I am talking about a deleted scene from Fire Walk With Me, and I thought, I, you know, again, I'm bogging things down by doing that. However, I, uh, also because I think maybe this idea of home needs to be expanded more, too, and it wasn't doing it justice, because Cooper says to, uh, Cooper says to, Laura Palmer, I'm taking you home. You got to go home. He says home a number of times to her. I need to take you. I, I think he does in part 17, and I think he does in part 18 as well. I need to take you home. And then uh, Dougie says the word home. Uh, maybe that's, yeah, that's what we were talking. That's where it came from. And then Dougie ultimately comes, or a version, Dougie Cooper, I'm not sure what version of Cooper comes to Janie E at the end and comes home to uh to his family beginning of part 18 I, I think that all needs to be expanded i think there's something going on there the idea that what's important to cooper maybe for cooper he's blinded to the idea of the home was a bad place for laura palmer he, again i'm thinking out loud right now he i don't know why he would but oh home is a safe place i'm going to take you home i 
Cooper wants to go be, be welcomed into a home. He doesn't, he's homeless. <laughs> this, is, mm -hmm. this is the beginning of an essay <laughs> right here. He, he's a homeless character. We've never seen Cooper in a home. And uh, I think it's a valuable idea. I think it's a valuable thing to him and, and he needs it. And uh, so that part that you read got cut because I didn't expand on it enough. And um, there were more important things to write about at the time. But as you remind me, now I'm writing another one down for, for the future book of essays. So, so anyway. Cool. Well, I... People could thank me later. Yeah, um, yes. <laughs> they might not thank you. I don't know. <laughs> fair, fair, fair point. Um, and, and next we go into. Oh, oh, and by the way, as far as the home goes, like probably my single favorite scene, although it fluctuates, is is when uh, Cooper is at the statue with the security guard, mm. and he's just pulling on his sleeve, and the way. Right. He is, the way he says his own name and the way he says home is just, yeah. it is just gut-wrenching. Yes. I'm not even 100% sure why, but, but I've, I've probably told you that before, but I just love that scene. Yeah, yeah. And now on to the breakfast. So <laughs> Okay, yeah. This is the scene that spurred tonight's chat, because when we first talked five, six months ago, I asked you if there were any missing pieces. And the one that you were probably most excited to talk about was... <laughs> This scene, you're like, I spent days and days working on it. <laughs> and, and, and maybe I cut it a little too impulsively, but I'm going to read some excerpts. And it says, Breakfast with the Joneses featuring the absent-minded antics of Dale Cooper. If you're looking for slapstick comedy, look no further. And then you kind of describe what happens. And then we get to, Janie E. brings coffee. And Cooper stops short. The coffee triggers Cooper. Somewhere deep within his muted mind, a synapse fires. And then we skip a little bit. Unprompted, Cooper says, hi. And this is the first time Cooper as Dougie offers a reply of his own making. Did Cooper just wake up? Did the coffee shock him back to reality? Alas, no. And then it goes on for a little bit. Good stuff. It is good stuff. I wish I kept it. <laughs> I... This is that chapter. I think this is this is part five, right? Or is it part? I, I forget what part this comes out of. I think it comes out of part five, right? This this. Uh, it might be. It's not labeled. Part, it's not labeled on my document. Maybe it's part. There's something part okay. four, but yeah, okay. Well, anyway, it's at this point in the book mm -hmm. where I was questioning myself. Oh, okay. And what am I giving to the reader? Am I giving the reader anything of value? And that stayed in there for a long time. Uh, and, you know, I I didn't know if that section you just read furthered a, an argument or if it, if it um, provided anything of value. Um, when you read it, I think it does. I think it's interesting. Although, again, I just say I ask questions rather than any, give you any kind of, you know, um, theory. I just say... Does this wake him up? No, it doesn't. It seems like it does, which is pretty obvious, really. Um, but uh, it is an interesting scene. Uh, Lynch was obviously spent a lot of time making that scene, and it is the scene. It, you know, it speaks to now. <laughs> we're, it's it all happening here after <laughs> we talk. It speaks to that idea of home. Here's what I should have written. <laughs> um, and. And Cooper maybe subconsciously or deep down valuing this, this moment, just having breakfast with his son mm. and enjoying, because I do write about when he eats the pancake and because uh, I watched it so closely, I watched McLaughlin, how he responded to that bite of pancake with the syrup and how his face just melts, just I, is a sensation that's hitting him. Um which speaks to who Cooper was in the original series, the idea that those those things in life that just invigorated him, you know, ducks yeah. on the pond or, you know, whittling a, a whistle in the trees. And um, I didn't realize that. I don't until really right now. I think I could have I could have written about what was happening potentially to Cooper there, what was important, and what he wanted maybe ultimately to return to in part 18. 
Um, but I just needed to move. I needed to move on in that chapter. And it seemed like, and I think it's true that I'm just sort of making some observations and I'm not giving you anything. Now that I've had some time and we're talking, I see how I might integrate that into mm -hmm. the value of that scene and what it's doing for the overall arc of that character. So, oh well. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I got I mean, so it goes. <laughs> And I would argue, even if even if it didn't have any sort of theoretical or analytical value, that particular scene is just so pleasurable for any fan of the show to watch. And yeah, for all the reasons you described, including uh, a, the, the very famous spitting at the coffee moment, which is which is maybe perhaps as you wrote there, which I didn't read, that might be a little bit of a callback to him spitting at the coffee from from being overexcited drinking the coffee by the chalkboard when, when he was thrown. Exactly. I, I, that's in that's that cool. passage too. He, he drinks the coffee and he spits it out and, and he's done that before that yeah. Cooper drank the coffee, you know, when they were going to throw the rocks and he spits it out. And, you know, I remember the first time I watched that, it was like a reaction of, of, you know, he's repelled, you know, he's repulsed by the coffee, but in, instead he loves the coffee so much. <laughs> he spits it out and it, it doesn't seem to make sense, and yet it's Cooper. It's how Cooper is. He, 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 he uh, the the sensation of it is so extreme in him that he spits it out rather than swallows it, and um, and and yeah, it comes that comes out again in that scene. And so um, I, I, yeah, the more we talk about it, the more I wish I'd put it in there, and I, the more I'm thinking somehow maybe I will <laughs> write something about it and and put it back out there again because th these pieces some of these pieces are fitting together now yeah good um <clears throat> i'm going to read you two separate ones because it's one sentence each and then you could you could take as long as you want on either so th the first one says and this is under part seven i think it says could cooper in the red room i.e the path one cooper mm -hmm. <laughs> Observing Hawk describes these diary pages, believe the lost page might hold a crucial secret about Laura. Laura. And, and actually, I'll stop there. But the reason I, I highlighted that was uh, the Path One Cooper, presumably, was maybe something from your earlier thinking? Or is this, mm -hmm. or is this nope. really the Red Room floor yep. uh, separating and go, him going two paths? So I was struggling for a while with trying to maintain in the text the idea that there were two pathways that Cooper went on. One is he's still in the red room. And I talk about this, it's all laid out. That he sees the overlapping red room. And, and I say that's the most crucial juncture in the story because uh, you know his mind remains in the red room essentially where all the physical aspect of him goes out and becomes Dougie. Mm -hmm. And so there's sort of, the Cooper that's watching it and the Coopers that experiencing it. And I wanted, for a while, I was trying to clarify that for the reader and I was calling it path one Cooper and I was calling it path two Cooper. And uh, I felt like, who's gonna remember what path one is or path two is? And, <laughs> yeah. and, uh, and then I just said, don't, don't do that. And so that's why I, that's still there, that path one Cooper. Um, but then the other part of that, I, I forget what I'd have to look. You were reading about, uh, oh, the Car Carrie Page and the diary. Yeah. And, and is Cooper thinking of, uh, you know, uh, what happened to the missing page? I come back, I talk about that a little bit in the book, you know, that sort of there's a clue there that Carrie Page is the missing page. And while I don't go into great detail to explain it in some perfectly clarified why is this work the way it does i at least acknowledge that the missing page could be carry page yeah and the next one is um it says cooper follows this is at the police station cooper's attention is diverted by a woman walking down the hall wearing red high heel shoes Cooper follows the woman's feet as she walks past, but his gaze halts when he notices an electric outlet behind her on the wall. And then you speculate possibly at why that scene was filmed. And 
that, that's just a interesting scene to watch and you know where he's he's sort of captivated by the american flag and he even hears the patriotic music and then he watches these red shoes and then stops and he sees the outlet so you could you could talk about what you were saying in this passage or why you cut it or just what you think in general about that scene well, and one of the things I observe that also in that passage uh, is that there's this sort of odd framing uh, behind Cooper when he is watching. He watches the woman go by. Maybe he's thinking of Audrey Horn. Some people speculate that because of the, the shoes that the woman is wearing is similar to the ones that Audrey was wearing in the pilot. Uh, there's not enough for me to say that that's what it is. It's just Lynch likes women in those shoes i think is you know that that's the aesthetic that he likes and so uh and then yes of course the the the, the gaze uh he stops and he looks he sees the electric outlet and then there's the idea of that he came out of an outlet or the electricity or you know is, is that going to trigger him we know in retrospect for his mind to return to him but behind cooper on the wall are these two blocked outlets there's these two um, I don't know what you call them. They're like panels, you know. They're 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 just plates there that essentially blocking any switch or outlet, mm. uh, you know, from being there. And and they're in weird they're in weird places. They they did they don't look like they would naturally or you know if you were building a, a yeah right. a, a wiring a, a building that you would have outlets there. If you look at the scene, it's it's interesting. And so. I wanted to just comment on it, and um, I just cut it again. Probably cut it because there were, I didn't have enough to, to, other than that observation. Oh, look, there's these. What does it mean? He can't get. It said it symbolizes that he can't yet awaken. Um, maybe I don't know. I, I wanted to show people that interesting observation, but then it was like, well, I don't know. I don't know where else to go with it and so i cut it but but it is interesting if you you know i mean if you go back and you look at that scene you see what's behind cooper's head um it, it it's deliberate i'm sure a lynch wanted it to be that way and so we could speculate and if i spent more time i might have done it but then again if i spent more time i might have bogged that chapter down on, on that so so i cut it makes sense yeah i know i never really i never noticed that that covered panel that is interesting to think about i think there's two i think there's yeah. two which makes it even more unusual if there had been one it's easy to dismiss yeah but there's two yeah. and they're they're out they're out of alignment on the wall uh they're not parallel with one another and so again lynch frames very deliberately mm -hmm. he frames the backgrounds i mean you can see other scenes to what's behind someone's head is often meaningful and and designed by Lynch. And and that I'm sure that that was the case there. And I think there are valuable things to comment on there. And um, it's just one of those things, unfortunately, that got left by the wayside. Yeah. The, ne the next passage, the part I highlighted says, the, uh, the woodsman never realized that Ruth Davenport had written the coordinates on her arm the true coordinates to the portal near Jack Rabbit's palace. That was part of a passage that you cut. But I also have a side question for you. And my, my side question is, um, here's Ruth's arm or the photo of it. Here's the, uh, the coordinates that Diane sends later. And they're not the same number. There's like an extra zero in the one that Diane sends. And I just found that really odd and it, interesting and maybe um, maybe an accident do you think that was like uh, do you have any thoughts on that i would have to look at it more closely there are i do i do um point out in a few footnotes that sometimes when you see texts uh on diane's phone they don't match up to later texts you know they're they're yeah. different times that they were sent um it's funny because before we started recording i was talking to you about geocaching which is something yeah. i do as a hobby and it all has to do with coordinates mm -hmm. uh and uh a leading zero on like a north or a west coordinate is just you ignore it so you can put it in or you can take it out i don't know if that's yeah. the case here i'd have to look at it but 
sometimes a zero doesn't affect anything. Um, not that I'm crediting the second unit production, you know, insert people for thinking it all the way through that way, because obviously there were mistakes, but um, yeah, I don't think it's anything good to <laughs> probably to spend too much time on. Yeah, but um, uh, but you did cut that passage as well. Um, yeah, I cut that. And just brief comment. I cut that because uh, you know you uh, this gets into the backstory, which doesn't always hold together. On what is Mister C's plan? He's trying to get the coordinates. He was trying to intercept. Uh, he was trying to get someone to break in. Ray's involved. He's got Bill Hastings involved. The secretary's involved. Major Briggs comes in. Um, it. I think Mark Frost had it all figured out and I think it would hold together if we hear all the Frost version. Mm. Uh, but the way it's presented to us in the return, um, there are things that don't quite fit. And so I think you may be getting to a part that I cut where I really get in, get, I got confused by the backstory. And I think that's just a remnant of that backstory that doesn't quite hold together. Yeah, that makes sense. Here's a Santino scene. It's tempting to think that in this moment, Cooper somehow recognizes Laura Palmer's theme from Twin Peaks, which the pianist song strongly resembles. If so, this would be the first instance where non-diegetic music intrudes on the fiction. Uh, and then you continue for a little while. And that, that reminded me of some thoughts that I had about that scene as well, where I was wondering, it is like, is like, Cooper somehow recognizing Angelo Badalamenti himself, like in some way, but you yeah, some of, people you thought that. that as well. Yeah, yeah, some people thought that when it happened, like Cooper's hearing, you know, mm -hmm. Badalamenti music, um, and then I I speculate in the cut passage that in fact it sounds more like sycamore trees that he heard when he was actually in the red room. So oh, okay, so there's a legitimate reason for him to be you know acknowledge this music that he seems to suddenly be aware of um again another part i cut out just because it was uh there wasn't it there i didn't expand on it enough and it was too much of an interruption in the in the in the stories or in the you know description of what's going on so i just took it out although again you know some of these things like that one and a lot of the other little like single paragraph observations that got removed um, these were things that people were talking about when the show was on and I made notes about and I had like this long thick notebook of, of curious things mm -hmm. and many of those did end up as footnotes um, yeah, but some sense. of them got deleted uh, because there was there wasn't enough there is it Sycamore Trees? Is it? it's not Bad Lamente music but at the same time I, do I need to spend, you know, a paragraph on it? So got it. it it's uh, some of those are maybe observations that are better suited for Twitter, perhaps. I don't know exactly. Right. Got it. Yeah. Um, here's a footnote that got cut, and this I'd like to hear a bit about. Cooper's purity resembles the transcendent condition described in Hindu philosophy as moksha, a state of peace and bliss. For some Hindus, moksha is the ultimate spiritual goal, and those who achieve moksha, and pardon the pronunciation, those who achieve moksha are described as luminous and serene. Yeah, actually, actually, that didn't get, uh, I mean, it got cut from there, but I actually integrated that observation into um, uh, um, my description of Andy, uh, Andy being this sort of... Um, a pure character and i i think it's either a footnote or it's in the text itself where i bring in the moksha idea there so okay maybe i i sent you a section that's cut but it wasn't really cut yeah, <laughs> it was just so repurposed so. uh here's another one that you might not remember what this is referring to because there's no context you wrote given my theory that cooper is watching events unfold from the realm of the red room it is tempting to explain Bobby's comment as Cooper's unreliable mind conveying a non-chronological story to believe that Cooper is, quote, jumping around the narrative, giving us bits and pieces of it as he sees fit. Time is unreliable in Twin Peaks, 
et cetera, et cetera. Yeah, again, another section that probably was reintegrated. Uh, I did talk about Cooper uh, jumping around in the tech, text early, early on. I This is the section you're talking about here is where Bobby comes in and he he's talks to Ed and Norma and he says, I found we found something today. But then if you go and you do the calculations, it's like 10 days earlier that they yeah. found that. Uh, this thing that had to do with his father. And so I um, I was just bringing it up again there, but I had already done it in other places. And so um, I just figured, okay, this, again, again, I, I've sent you some things that now that you're reading them to me, um, they were deleted, but they were also reintegrated. So yeah. it's not legitimate to say they were, were all deleted. Uh, they were reused, repurposed. <laughs> I have I have another cool one, and it's about the drunk in the jail. Mm. And incidentally, this is not mm -hmm. something you wrote, but I just thought this morning I was thinking about him, and I realized that he's kind of positioned in the same jail cell location, although a different jail, as the uh, the woodsman whose head floats away down the jail cell for mm. these things. And they're both kind of mm. in the same, like, far right jail cell. I don't know if that matters. Probably not. But anyway, you wrote, um, there's something odd about his presence here. Andy and Lucy don't acknowledge him, and only Chad seems to be aware of his presence. Could he, the drunk, like Nido, have been maneuvered to the jail by higher forces? And I just think that's great fun to think about. Um, but, but that one got cut, too. It, it is great fun to think about. And I had a lot more. Um, I, so I, for, for a while there, for a moment, let's put it that way. I really thought I had solved the drunk. I thought, oh, <laughs> he is another one of the many observers, these bizarre figures that are in the background. That, and I, I, do, I do briefly mention that at some point, that the drunk fits in this sort of category of of inexplicable characters that are commenting on or watching what's going on around them uh, you know there's the the 119 um and there's the the, the weird figure to have to acknowledge before they leave um uh, uh, beulahs and uh and, and there's others um and and the drunk is one of them and mm -hmm. and i thought for for a long time i was certain that only um uh um I'm sorry, the names are, are, are uh, Chad. Only Chad could see him. I was like, but then there's a scene where it looks like James acknowledges him. James turns his head and, and, uh, and, and, uh, or, and it, there might have been another sequence. It seemed quite fit. That doesn't matter. So what? You know, <laughs> he's still this figure. And in fact, I wrote a long piece that I it wasn't even in my file that I, I know I wrote about, or at least I had notes and rough draft. Maybe it didn't even get typed up. I bet it didn't get typed up. Where I go into the whole, the whole scenario, which is not in. I didn't keep it in the book. It's not in the book at all. Of how Chad sneaks out, you know, from the jail cell. He has the key in his boot. He gets the key out. He unlocks the jail cell. He goes down. He gets a gun, you know, and all of that. I didn't include in the book because when you're in part seventeen, you have got to get <laughs> to those main, yeah. those main you know, uh, narrative points to keep the story going. So the drunk essentially is keeps, if, if you think about it the right way, the drunk keeps Chad in place until the right moment. Then the drunk falls asleep and Chad can go out. If Chad had gone out any earlier, everything would have been messed up, you know? And so there's an argument that could be made that the drunk is there, put in place by the fireman or Major Briggs, so that everything will go according to plan. And I had all this written out and all this thought out. But when you're in part 17, again, it's a yeah. broken record. <laughs> I, you know, it's like I can't bog it down with all of that right now. Um, maybe, again, there should have been a different chapter about all these bizarre figures and how they figure into the story. But the drunk is fascinating, and he certainly fits in with this idea that there are bizarre figures that are there 
um, perhaps they have they're deliberately placed there to do something. And an argument sure can be made that that drunk keeps Chad in place uh, until until you know until Andy's and NATO and James and Freddie are all in place so that Freddie can knock him out. <laughs> so. But at the same time, it all seems nonsensical. So yeah, uh, yeah. rather than... Well, intentional or otherwise, he, he, he does end up serving that function, whether it's intentional or otherwise. He does keep Chad there. Yeah, yeah. And he also, so anyway, he, he also creates great effect on the atmosphere. <laughs> well, you know, and that might be all it is, too, because I do talk about, you know, Lynch likes to sometimes just create an aesthetic behind the scenes that sort yeah. of, you know honking horns in the intersection and the woman yelling, why is this happening? Yeah. You know, it all is this ambiance that illustrates the turmoil in Bobby's mind. And so the drunk may be simply that, a reflection of Chad's or even the energy in the jail cell mm. of what this nexus of events that's happening. But yeah, that's a great connection to, to, to the way, uh, to the, to the Bobby in the street traffic. So yeah. It's a great connection. That's that scene, and that traffic scene is interesting because um, you have you have parents and their and their kids who just who just shot a gun unwisely. Right. You know, you have exactly. Bobby and his daughter, and the guy in the car and his son. Um, absolutely. The Diane essay is absolutely one of the highlights of the book. By the by, the way, the um, the essay about David Lynch's approach. And I think it's called I Got Idea Man. Killer. So one of the things that's happening with me when I read the book and I dip back into it here <laughs> or there, um, I, I don't know, I, I get like new favorite parts. So each time I read. And I'm not embarrassed to say it. I don't care. I like the book. I think it's great, you know? And I, and it's as far as things one could do with their time, you, you want to do what you like to do. One of the things I like to do is watch the show. I like to read the book. So, but anyway, that that's a great essay, the Idea Man essay. Um, but here's some stuff from Diane. Cooper also knew that his shadow self would likely target Diane, and so he went to her like he went to Cole and confi confided the dangerous nature of his undertaking. Skipping a few sentences, it's easy to imagine him directing mm -hmm. Diane, stepping her through the plan telling her just how crucial she was to what he was doing, skipping a bit. Dale Cooper manipulated Diane. He didn't abuse her. He certainly didn't assault her like Mr. C would do, but he took advantage of her. He co-opted Diane into a scheme that would threaten her life and expose her to unspeakable evil, and he did it by wooing her into consent, skipping a little bit. Cooper's plan is almost impossible to delineate completely. The return provides few clues to go on, but the clues it does supply strongly support the idea that Cooper prepared Diane to double cross Mr. C. So there's a lot of different stuff going on here. Um, take it away. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you know, this was, this was, you asked earlier, I think this was the hardest thing to cut. I think okay. um, I, this was in the essay. And I sent this essay off to Jeff Lemire, who is a, a, a wonderful creator. He's written lots of comics and he's got lots of adaptations of his work on TV. He's very kind to give me a blurb on the back of the book. And he read it and he loved it. He was, I mean, so enthused about the Diane essay. But then he said, "This is there's a lot here that you're speculating about. And it's hard to know for sure if this, you know, if this all fits together and you, you're making some intuitive jumps. And he said, it's not that the text isn't helping you. So, you know, and so the more I thought about it, the more I realized, it, you know, it was, it was, I was assigning a lot of meaning or, or I was, uh, I was speculating on a backstory without a lot of evidence. And one of the things that I caught, which is the whole thing of Diane saying, he only kissed me once before. And I thought, well, that's when it happened. That's when Cooper did it. He kissed Diane and to kind of make her become part of the plan. Now, I still believe that Diane was part of the plan. Cole confirms it, essentially. This involves something you know about. That's enough said about that. And then the Blue Rose case. You can 
and this is all in that Diane essay, you can extract the backstory that Diane was savvy to what Cooper wanted to have happen. But I started making these speculations that Cooper had essentially manipulated her like Mr. C did. And I think uh, some of that's still in the book. There's a great value to that because Diane becomes this pawn to both aspects of Cooper. They both treat her, they don't both treat her the same way by any means, but they both use her. And again, all that's still in the essay. Mm. Uh, but uh, I took this stuff out because it was too much of me imposing a theory that did there just wasn't enough to support it. And I felt bad about it because it sure works great. I mean, it works great. But, like, you know, it's like one of those theories you read online or somebody on Twitter, they put out a theory and you read it and you go, that's a great theory. I love it. You made me think about it differently, but you don't really have any evidence to support it, you know. And so part of the thing is I got to kind of support it. And so so I keep looking over at it. Um it's so close to being supported, but it's just not there. And so I took it out. Uh, and, and I had to rework that essay a little bit. That essay, I'd say the Diane essay probably mm. would had uh, the most reworking done to it. It had a different introduction. And then that, the new introduction was added in front of the original introduction and, and blah, blah, blah. It, it's boring to everyone. But mm -hmm. Diane, is a, it, Diane is such a fascinating element of the story because she has a storyline going on outside of the frame. And I don't think there's any doubt about that. I really believe that. There's evidence there that Diane has a story arc and things are happening. And she, and I think I, I, think I successfully convey what happens, at least a, a, a good theory, as to what happens to Diane in the story and what, and she, she takes control of her destiny. She writes her own story. She writes herself out of the story. Hmm. This is a thought I've had recently about the idea of, because Charlie says that, Audrey, do you want me to end your story too? And the idea that maybe you give control to someone else and they start to write your story for you. Mm. And I think Diane was doing that. And then she stops and she writes her own story. But anyway, um, I, I, I don't know what else. I mean, I'm just, I'm just sort of uh, thinking out loud here. I, I think this speaks to the difficulty of writing an essay about these kinds of things and having something that works so well, but then you got to look at it and say, sure. I mean, you know, it used to be a great example would be everyone assumed when Firewalk with Me came out and Philip Jeffrey said, uh, we're not going to talk about Judy. Everyone thought Judy's the third girl. Everyone thought this. I, you, you may not be familiar with this because I know you're relatively new to Twin Peaks, but everyone said, oh, okay. Check Desmond. It was Teresa Banks. Dale Cooper, it was Laura Palmer, and Philip Jeffries, it was Judy. And, and it was like, okay, yeah, but where's the evidence? Yeah. Where's the evidence? There is no evidence to support that. He says the name of a, of a he says a female name. And everyone's like, well, there it is. <laughs> like, yeah, it's nice. It fits. It's beautiful. But um, I, in fact, I actually talk about that in the book uh, in, 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 at one point. Um, about who Judy is, and you know, trying to define who Judy is. Uh, so that, that's an example of us seeing what we want to see in it. And, and so that's what happened here. I wanted this to be there. And while I still think it might be the answer, I didn't have enough. The whole idea of Cooper kissing her, you know, and I speculated, he's manipulating her, he's doing all this stuff. I addressed some of that later. And, and, and satisfactorily for me, I get into Cooper's manipulation of Diane. I had to, I had to cut this uh, because uh, it was, it was, it was just, it wasn't enough to support it. And I would have been open to that criticism. I mean, somebody could legitimately go, you are, and I think Jeff Lemire did to some extent. You, you're kind of making it up. And, and I didn't want to do that. <laughs> So, so it was a matter of 
really perceptive and helpful criticism and I guess integrity at the end of the day that that <laughs> that you had to swallow the emotional bullet because you said this is the one you really didn't want to cut but you ended up doing it well I mean I this is the one I had to cut I had to cut it because it wasn't it wasn't I couldn't support it here's something but I had come up with this theory but again it's just like the Jeff from Philip Jeffries thing yeah it's beautiful theory but why but not why did you not cut the, um, I forget the exact quote, but you said when Cooper finally leaves the Red Room and he reemerges into Glastonbury Grove, it's not the same, it's not the same grove. And Diane is there. And Yeah. Um, uh, because you, a, what, How do you know it's not the same? What makes you say so? Uh, well, there's a, I think... Okay, you're right. I am being rather direct in in making that statement. It's not the same. Um, uh, first of all, there's a pattern that happens with Cooper leaving the Red Room. He encounters a version of Diane. So NATO was a Diane, you know, and he left. And you can see he has to go through these sort of uh, transitional places to get out. And so this, um, that seemed like it was transitional because... Diane is just magically there in the moment. I mean, sh how did she know to be there? If it really is the true Glastonbury Grove, did Diane <laughs> walk out of the woods by herself knowing in that moment that Cooper was going to come? I'm sure some fans believe that, and and, and I, I can't say that it's wrong, but, you know, I mean, it's, it's wow. Not only that, but the next yeah. scene, they're driving in a car in the desert, and uh, mm. it, where does that desert near Twin Peaks? I mean, I guess it could be in the middle of Washington state somewhere, but, uh, I, I, you know, it just, it's too surreal. It doesn't fit. Plus the fact, you know, there's so many other things that happen in that scene where Hooper says, is it really you? And Diane says, is it really you? They're, they're, uh, they react to one another differently. And then you can't prove a negative. I know, but if it were Glastonbury Grove, and I have this in a footnote, why isn't Cooper running down to see how Harry Truman's doing? You know, why doesn't he go? Harry Truman is literally 20 minutes away in the hospital. And why doesn't he go check on him? No, they transition to a car because I can't, I, I just, it, it does not work for me in that, you know, everything else that's happening, that this is Glastonbury Grove in the woods outside of Twin Peaks. That's a long answer maybe to your <laughs> yeah, but, but you had an answer, you know, and you had an answer and you're comfortable with it. And it, and it makes sense also. Yeah. Um, that whole that whole part of, of the chapter, that whole part of the book, in fact, um, was just, I, I just really liked it. And I reread it today. And uh, I, I just asked John if he would read that part for us. So um, uh, we have it kind of queued up now. If you don't mind, it's from page 309. Yeah. So this is what we were talking about. This is what I wrote in the book. Um, and it's uh, starting just at the point that Cooper is about to exit the Red Room. He's in front of uh, Leland. Cooper hears a ringing sound and purposely walks away from Leland and down an adjoining Red Room corridor. He twists his hand in the air, divining the exact spot where he needs to exit. A section of curtain flutters in the end of the hall, and Cooper steps through into what looks like Glastonbury Grove, the place where, 25 years earlier, Dale Cooper entered a portal in pursuit of Wyndham Earl and Annie Blackburn. But this is not the same Glastonbury Grove Cooper disappeared to all those years ago. And there's a footnote here. If it were, one might expect Cooper to pay a visit to nearby Twin Peaks and check in on his old friend, Harry Truman, or find out how Annie is faring after all this time. But he doesn't. In this Glastonbury Grove, Twin Peaks is nowhere to be found. And then back to the main text. Cooper emerges into a liminal space, a threshold between the psychological trappings of the Red Room and the real world. It's a place not unlike NATO's mansion room, which also linked one world to another. Cooper is passing through a peripheral realm as he makes his journey outward. And just like he did in the mansion room, Cooper encounters Diane. 
Cooper is relieved, as if he hoped to see her standing there. Diane, for her part, can't quite believe her eyes. Is it you, she asks? Is it really you? Throughout the return, we've accompanied Cooper on his journey and have some idea of what he's been through, but we know far less about Diane. Why is she here in these woods at this specific time? Although we don't see it play out on screen, Diane Evans has likely been on a journey much like Cooper's. Forced into an otherworldly realm by Mr. C, Diane was fractured into pieces and has, over the years, been reassembling herself. She succeeded. Diane has reconstituted and rebalanced herself and exited her own red room to wait for Cooper. And, perhaps, left part of herself in Las Vegas, just like Cooper did. So that's that. <laughs> Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Sure. Thanks. How did you enjoy reading that? Uh, yeah, I'm not used to reading it out loud, although I did do a reading in Snoqualmie a month ago. <laughs> and uh, yeah, it's nice to it's nice to read it out loud. I, I my wife has taught me to read it differently than I would just probably read it if I were reading it to myself to uh, <laughs> kind of keep in mind there's an audience listening. So yeah. I hope I did OK. Yeah, I really appreciate that. That was that was, that was a treat. Because when I was reading that on my own today, I was just really so struck by that particular section. Even, even though I had read it before and even though I'd read the, the, the Diane essay, that's not from the Diane essay, I don't think, but no. But, but yeah, it was just great. And um, for, for anybody that happens to be watching or listening to this, you got you got to get the book because if you think <laughs> if you think the cut passages that we're looking through tonight, if you think the cut passages are good, the stuff that actually made the cut is you know really good. Um, but thanks again, John. But back, sure. back to another cut passage, um, something brief here. You wrote, uh, Gordon Cole knows his way around the supernatural. Dot dot dot. Gordon Cole knows there's more to the world than what his five senses tell him. Uh, how do we recognize? How do we reconcile Cole's preternatural awareness with his lack of concern about Cooper's disappearance? What does Cole really know about the plan he supposedly concocted with Briggs and Cooper? And that last part you do talk about in the book, but uh, the first couple lines is from a, a passage that gets cut. We're mm -hmm. just getting into the fact that that Gordon Cole is in touch with more than just his five senses. But that was a nice way to say it. But that one didn't make it. Do you remember why? Oh yeah, this is this. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> yes. This is part 17, and so this is all the exposition. This is where Cole just basically tells Albert the backstory. And uh, I was struggling with a lot of the, you know, so much of the backstory is not there. You've got to piece it together. So Diane's backstory, which we had just read a piece, I think I'm confident that there is a backstory that you can kind of put together. It may be slightly different than the way I'm interpreting it, but there's still a backstory. There's something there off screen that is hinted at and 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 thought through to some extent by the creators of the show. Um, there's other backstory as well. Here we get Cole giving Albert in part the beginning of part 17 uh, all of what he couldn't tell Albert and what what you know what's really going on. But he still doesn't give us everything. And so I tried to, and I think I talked about this in another interview with you where I tried to write my way through it. I yeah. was like, okay, it's all there. Plus I've got all the scripts to everything, mm -hmm. um, transcripts of every part. When I highlighted every place where Cole talked about this. I had it all. I may even have printed out, you know, every part of it in one file so I could look at it and um it doesn't hold together it doesn't fit together it 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 who is what is ray's function why is ray uh this you know because he talks about ray uh, being an informant for the fbi but wait ray's working for philip jeffries and ray's working for mr c and who is uh, bill hastings secretary why is she involved in this story and what's the plan they were going to kill two birds with one stone they got to find jow day but so anyway <laughs> um 
what does two birds with one stone mean? And I talk about it in this section, which I, you know, somebody suggested, well, one of the, it was, uh, was to save Annie. That's one of the things. One of the goals is to save Annie. And I wrote all that out. And then that just didn't work. It just doesn't. Or at least, again, it's like with the part I was talking about earlier, um, you know, where I, I'm making up a story. Mm. And I, anyone can make up a story and make it all fit. We can all make up a story, make it all fit nice and clean but we're making it up. And so I was not going to do that. I was just not going to do that. And in fact, I think in the book, I say it, it doesn't hold together. It doesn't really work. We just have to, we just kind of have to jump over it. We have to just say, okay, there's a backstory, but it doesn't quite come together. And so there's a big section that I wrote and I spent, I, I don't know how long I spent. I know I spent days, trying to i thought i was going to be able to do it i was going to write it all out and the only person who could do it is mark frost mm. and it would differ from what we were shown because lynch tinkered with it so um so i had to cut it all and then cut it and i had to rewrite to some extent but i did not rewrite all of this cut material i cut it and then i just said i can't explain it i, <laughs> I don't it doesn't all come together and rather than try to give you something that i made up uh i just say that it doesn't it, you know we just sort of have to accept it for what it is and and then move on so i let you look at essentially speculation on my part which you know when i was writing it i hoped it would lead to the answer i didn't know if it would i assumed it would i certainly wouldn't have committed yeah. to it um and there are other parts of of my writings where it did lead to an answer or an answer that would could be supported with the text and um and this one just never fit fit together so so anyway <laughs> i'm going on and on for really something that no one's ever going to see because it doesn't have any value <laughs> well it, it does have value i would argue because yeah, I, I was i was driving to work one day talking to my friend and we just we were just talking about stuff. We came up with a short story idea where it's like a, a team of researchers trying to do an experiment and uh, an experiment fails. But the beginning of the story is them celebrating, like they're out having drinks, like they just, you know, and you're wondering why they're celebrating. But they're celebrating the fact that they were able to rule another thing out. And that was the celebration. Mm. So yeah, there, there's some value there. <laughs> <laughs> I yeah, know. but I, I I, I, I appreciate that. And I think in your story, it would work better yeah. <laughs> because um, I didn't really rule anything out. I just couldn't make it work. Yeah. Uh, and I, and I, and I don't, you know, but this does speak to, and I do think I get to, into this in the book a little bit. So, yeah. So what happens here is I can't make the plot make sense. So what can I contribute here? Well, I can talk about, Maybe Lynch and Frost had two different narrative aesthetics or different narrative approaches or, you know, they were working in tandem at, at one point and then they started working at odds. Or, and so I offer that and I support that with actual quotes from Mark Frost where he talks yeah. to David Bushman about, I don't know what Lynch was doing here. And, and so I can offer that. I can say, if you are confused... It may be because of this, and there's quotes and there's mm. you know evidence to support that. So, you know, we can be dismayed about the nonsensical plot, or we can say, "Oh, okay, it. Why did it happen?" And then there's value, I think, to that. So I hope. Yeah, and I, I like hearing I like hearing about uh, Gordon Cole's potential tapping into beyond the five senses. What I didn't notice the first, I guess the first time, maybe the first couple of times I watched it, you, you know, when he sees the sort of the hallucination of Laura in the doorway. At right. The hotel, um, during that hallucination, you could hear Sarah yelling Laura's name, and it's the same Laura that you hear at the end of part 18. Mm -hmm. And uh, I don't know what to make of that, but do you have any thoughts on that? Well, that was one of those parts where uh, it's like this part 17. I think I had a different 
uh, I, and I didn't include it in the file you have, and I don't remember why, but I had written through what what was happening to Cole there, why he was seeing Laura Palmer. But the, pro the problem is, the problem is, Morris in such great dismay there. And so if, I think my theory was that, that Cooper's trying to communicate with Cole in that part. He's trying to penetrate the, the realm, the Red Room realm, and communicate to Cole through dreams. And and that's a tricky thing, too, because what's he trying to say? And so I uh, was very careful, you know, not to, to, you know, make too many assumptions. But I do believe that Cole sees Laura. And so Laura is the one. And um, Laura is important. But Laura is the one because the dark age has has is is growing and and um she's going to end the dark age and it seemed sensible to me that she would be in dismay the, the laura he would see would not be one of peace and contentment but one of dismay because the dark age is on the rise and so he's he's sensing that laura is the one who would is channeling all of this this chaos and tragedy and trauma and he's getting that basic level that laura encapsulates that and may be the one who will end it cole doesn't get all you get it all figured out yeah but he's getting he's getting signals and that felt good to me that felt like that's why laura because lynch had to choose right he he's gonna gonna think about it this way lynch is gonna show laura laura palmer cole's gonna see laura palmer when Lynch is going to show Laura Palmer to Cole, he could choose all these different Laura Palmers that he could show to Cole in that moment. And he would respond the same way, right? He'd be startled. There's this apparition of Laura. Is it Laura laughing in the red room? Is it Laura giggling with James? Is it, uh, or Bobby? He picks that one. He picks that crying sequence. I try to think what what is what is lynch trying to convey as well and and it fit with my other theories about laura yeah that's a little amazing. bit of a stretch no doubt but not enough that i delete it it was it was like okay <laughs> this this is satisfactory and i think it, it did fit so and then yeah and then to choose that particular image of laura and then to pair it with sarah yelling her name the, the same well yeah same because then you just... know it's that it's that yelling of the name at the mm -hmm. end of part 18 that really allows the, the, the true self of laura to resurface in that moment on the street and i would argue again this is all my theory but i i feel like the text supports it in that moment laura comes to realize ah this is why i was sent to earth this is why i this is my destiny the name laura triggered her and she screams and so i would argue that uh that it's foreshadowed then when cole is getting the vaguest sense of the larger scheme at play which maybe even cooper doesn't quite well, I mean, Cooper never gets it. <laughs> so, <yeah. laughs> so anyway. Well, speaking of which, that's a good transition because the next section, and it's possible that I'm combining different ones together. So stop me if yeah. I am. But I'm going to read a bit. Uh, despite his good intentions, Cooper does not truly understand who or what Laura Palmer is. He cannot comprehend the extent of her suffering, nor what she must do to defeat the forces of trauma surrounding her. And then I'm going to skip just a bit. Stymied and confused, Cooper ends up trapped in the Red Room, still unable to decode the secrets of Laura Palmer. And then something unexpected happens. When Laura Palmer tells Cooper in part two, I'm dead, yet I live, Cooper receives his first hint that Laura may be reachable, that he could still change her fate. Uh, and then I'm going to skip just a little bit. Laura is pulled from the Red Room before Cooper's eyes, a tantalizing, a tantalizing suggestion that Cooper might follow. A moment later, Cooper encounters Leland Palmer, or some figment of him, who urges Cooper to find Laura. These two encounters cause Cooper to reassess Laura Palmer and his connection to her. 
he rethinks his plan. He may still want to find Judy, but now he wants to fix the past and prevent Laura from dying. No wonder Gordon Cole worries that the plan is not unfolding properly. He has no idea that Cooper has revised it. So there was a lot there. Yes. So some of that I still held on to, but some of it doesn't work. I mean, that was just simply the fact that uh, I, you know, at the beginning part of what you were reading is that I say that Cooper could still change her fate. I basically, okay, basically that's an early theory that was holding the book together for a while. And while a lot of it, again, is still manifests in this, in my theory, um, some of what I was writing there, it, 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 you know, I, I was reevaluating Cooper and, and um, y- you know, what Cooper's motivations are to go after Laura. Is he going after to save her? That's what I'm saying in this section. Or is he going after her because he thinks he can be a superhero, be, you know, the one and only that, you know, he can fix things. Mm. And so... One has more to do with Laura and one has more to do with Cooper. And my original theory here, I was saying that Cooper was doing it because he wanted to help Laura. And then later I'm revising and saying he's doing it because he, he thinks, uh, you know, he's super powerful. It's subtle, but, I, you know, this is just an example of how as I'm combing through the the theories and what holds it all together, mm-hmm. it's very easy for it to fall apart if you're not constantly, you know, keeping the pieces firmly in place that that hold the theory together. And and some of what you read contradicts the theory. So I I I just had to delete and rework. Makes sense. Thank you. We have, I believe reached the end of the document that you shared with me (laughs) Um, yeah and we took our time and i'm glad we did and the other document that i have in front of me um is probably for another day but it's it's at least as many quotations uh at least as many but from the actual book that remains and I, i know we talked about the book in the past but that was a lot of that was really about the process of coming up with the book the process of crafting it um, it was not so much content focused, but uh, yeah, m- maybe maybe some other time we'll get into a couple of those questions. But I, I would like to ask you just two, if you don't mind. Sure. Yeah. And uh, well, here's here's just a random one. Um, do you have any other like favorite theories or ideas or even just like little random observations that other people have made about the return specifically that uh, that just got you excited or maybe generated your own thought in some new way? I know we've talked about Tim Kreider's piece in the past, but is, is there is there anything that uh, is jumping to mind? You know, the short answer is yes, and you're putting me on the spot because I'm not sure yeah. I can remember. Um, I do hear th- – I'm gonna, so I'm going to answer generically. I mm-hmm. do hear people make a suggestion about I – mean, there was something – I wish I could remember what it was um, – and I think, oh, you know, that's an interesting way of looking at looking at Twin Peaks. Uh, I didn't think of that. I, I'm sorry, I'm not giving you an example. Yeah, it's okay. The, again, again, generic answer is I do hear things that that I think, oh, that's a, that's a good idea. Um, but you know, again, most of them are like on Twitter, or I haven't yeah. seen, I haven't really read anything in depth. And maybe the Greg Olson book that's coming out at the end of this year will be will be the thing because no you know i mean i know john bernardi's written some great stuff and i know there are some some pieces uh, that are that do go in to some depth but um there hasn't been a long study of it uh and i'm not necessarily saying it has to be like a book length study of it but um i guess martha nockinson is the only other one so far you know that's published a fairly lengthy examination of of the return in one long chapter of her most recent book um and with anyway, Nockhamson I oh it's, I've always said this about her writing I off I almost always disagree with it and it almost always is the most valuable thing I've read 
Yeah. You know what I mean? I don't I don't know. And I, I hope my book does. I don't care if people disagree with it. But if if I can do the same thing that Martha Knox, because it's funny. I, yeah. I all go with, you know, it's no, no. But then I'll be like, but I never thought of it that way. And now I'm thinking of it in a way I want to take it. Like, so if I hadn't read it, I never would have got there. She wrote a thing about the uh, editing of the first 30 minutes of Firewalk with Me how the editing is different in the first 30 minutes than the rest of the film. Mm. And when I read that, I thought, well, the first 30 minutes is a dream. <laughs> and that's when I uh. came up with that theory that maybe the first 30 minutes of Firewalk Me is a dream because she pointed out that the editing was different. I'm like, well, why is the editing different? Mm. The editing is different. She had a different reason. But I'm like, well, if that's deliberate, if the editing is deliberately different, and something's being conveyed, it's supposed to be different. Okay. So anyway, there it is. That that's not what you answer. There's yeah. an answer. No, that's that's great. <laughs> that's great. This this the second the second question is definitely more up your alley. Um, so you will be able to answer this, I think. I'm actually gonna quote you. So this is a quote from uh, our first our first chat that we had. And you were talking about the difference between story and discourse. And I think this is a direct quote. So discourse is the way a story is told. I can tell you this. Oh, the, the story is like the events that happen and discourse is the way a story is told. Mm -hmm. it, I could tell you a story in a way that's extremely boring or I could show you a story in a way that you cannot stop watching, end quote. So my question for you is, can, can you talk a little bit about the persuasive or the hypnotic or the compelling discourse in Twin Peaks? Well, that's a big question. Yeah, I know. Um, I know. I know. That's well, I think it, you know. I mean, it's it's interesting. I think it has to do with Lynch. I mean, Lynch is you know the visuals and the sound and the way he draws you in to. This is all very generic too, but um, it's captivating. It's mesmerizing. It it, uh, <laughs> you know, it it it. I, you just you get lost in it. And so uh, I think part of what happens is, for me anyway, is though, you know, the first time you encounter, well, okay, a lot of things can happen. The first time you encounter Lynch, I mean, Inland Empire, I just came out of like, I don't, I don't know what's going on. Forget it. You know, I'm not, <laughs> oh, I don't want to tackle that. Um, or I can watch something like part three of Twin Peaks The Return in NATO's mansion room and, I'm just like totally involved, even though I have no idea what's going on. And in either case, you have to get past those, those wonderful experiences uh, or troubling or difficult experiences in the case of Inland Empire, and then come back to it again and start to kind of try to... Um, figure out maybe why Lynch is doing it this way or how does this enhance the story he's trying to tell, you know? Um, is it simply aesthetic, which I think in some cases it's just, he likes it. I'm gonna do it because it looks good. And in a lot of cases, I think too often he's dismissed for being weird for weird's sake. I've never thought that about Lynch. Mm -hmm. He's not weird for weird's sake. If you watch his, talking about making this show in those behind the scenes thing he's got it in his head he knows how it's got to fit together and so some of his aesthetic has much of his aesthetic has great meaning to the story so i'm probably really wandering away from what you were asking but um I, you know um it's that i think draws me in mm. other directors do too Lynch has just been the one, I guess, that I've devoted myself to. It might have been ended up being someone else, but I, I think, I think Lynch is able to convey the the mind of a character hmm. um, in such a way that uh, the clues are there to kind of decipher a character. Uh, I. Obviously, that's my theory in Twin Peaks to Return, but I think it happens in Mulholland Drive. I think it happens in uh, um, Inland Empire and, um, and and other places. And so uh, I just I find that that 
just something just appeals to me about it. And so um, I spend an inordinate amount of time thinking about it and then writing about it. So <laughs> and talking about it and talking about as, it, <laughs> as was the case tonight. And um, yeah. like, like I said, I have we, we got through half of the material with <laughs> the material. <laughs> so, so maybe even whether it's whether it's recorded or off camera or whatever, I'd, I'd still love to chat about some of the stuff that actually made the cut in the book sure. and, and maybe yeah. some other general things as well. But um, I guess my final question for you is, was this an experience that was interesting in any way, being able to talk about all these cut pieces? Uh, yes. And in fact, I think you saw maybe it happen in real time. I started to see patterns I hadn't seen before, particularly the stuff we were talking about home and, and, uh, I, I, and started to think, oh, you know, there was, there was stuff to explore that I missed or um, I may never have come to if we hadn't had this conversation. I don't know if I'm going to write anything. But, I, you know, I, I've got I want to write about Mulholland Drive. I've got these interviews that we did way back when. I just mm -hmm. think it's enough for a core and I can write about it. But, um, yeah, I don't know. I, I, I don't know if I have enough for a book, but Twin Peaks is – I can't imagine I'm done with it. So – We'll see. We'll see what happens because you, uh, you've got me thinking about some stuff that we're, I think is worth exploring again. So, I I didn't I didn't know I when I guess when we were going to talk about this I thought oh well I'm going to talk more about the craft of writing the book and why it was deleted, which I think is all has some value to it to some extent. I don't know how many people are going <laughs> to sit through it, um, but I didn't I you made me think of some things I hadn't thought of before and that scary. <laughs> <laughs> well, I was I was actually gonna ask you to uh to, I was gonna put you on the spot for 15 seconds and um do like a direct to viewers message like <laughs> why would anybody want to watch this? Because this is gonna be pretty long. Um so my question for you is why why would anybody want to watch <laughs> this recording that we made tonight? Uh, well, if anyone gets this far, then they'll find out, I guess. Um, uh, I, um, well, I mean, I think there's a great value of talking about, just talking about Twin Peaks, because when you talk about Twin Peaks, I used to have conversations with Craig Miller that went on this long, three hours, unstructured, we would just talk. And, it, and if you didn't do that, then those ideas aren't going to come. Hmm. You can't, I mean, you can sit with a piece of paper and you can write out a lot of stuff and I can do it and I've done it and, and the ideas come and, and when I'm writing it out, I find the ideas. But also when you get other people asking you questions or you can get their points of view, um, it helps you reassess or, or come up with some new ideas. So um, I don't know if this is a good answer. The, the value of it is, uh, if you want to talk, if you want to write about Twin Peaks, uh, try to talk about Twin Peaks. How's that? I'll sum it up in one sentence. <laughs> <laughs> talk as much about Twin Peaks as you can. Yeah. And then as soon as you're done, go watch some uh, extra footage from Inland Empire. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Oh, boy. <laughs> yeah. Mine's in the mail, so I'm looking forward to that and probably later this week. But uh, I hope you enjoy watching all that. Yeah. Well, I'm going to watch... I'm only going to watch part of it tonight. I'm yeah, only going to yeah. watch a small part of it tonight. So, yeah, cool. Is there anything else you wanted to add? No, I, 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 I should just say, um, I appreciate you for showing such a keen interest in what I've done. I mean, uh, you know, I, I read my first really negative review of my book today, so I'm saving this to the very mm -hmm. end. So I, I don't want to. I don't. Maybe no one will read it. Somebody wrote a fairly negative review and it's online. And uh, I thought, well, okay. I mean, I got a lot of good reviews. It's okay to get a negative review. And they gave some reasons why. Um, it sure is nice to have someone else though <laughs> appreciate what you've written. And so uh, I do greatly appreciate that you have spent so much of your time on something I wrote. So, um, Thank you for that. 
Sounds good. And thank you because uh, I, I like the show. I like engaging with it. And um, yeah. And I've told you that before, you know, the, the book is just a wonderful companion. And, and there's a lot, of, a lot in the book that's just as satisfying and invigorating as uh, episodes from the show. So I've said that before. I don't want to overdo it. But, yeah. um, well, I, I got a terrible review this week too. On my, oh, you did <laughs> on my grammar um, course. <laughs> oh, you did what from a from a peer or? Uh, it was just somebody who took the course who um, <laughs> is not a native speaker and basically was saying it was like it was too hard to follow the course. Which oh, is, okay, yeah. But I have some good ones. My too. my <laughs> negative review was uh, something to the effect of that I I relied on Wikipedia and. Hinduism for dummies, and uh, it was wasn't really worth anything. Uh, you know that I hadn't gone into enough depth. Well, I kind of acknowledge. I don't. I've always said I don't know. I, I'm not. I'm not trying to defend myself. And Nick, yeah. I've always said if someone's going to write a negative review, tell me why. Because there's some mm -hmm. there's some like one star reviews on Amazon, but there's no review. It's just I rated it one star. Yeah. What? Yeah. I, I mean. Tell me why you didn't like it. So this person at least told me why they didn't like it. They thought I'm a neophyte when it comes to Hinduism. Well, they're not wrong. They're not wrong. So that's a legitimate review of the book. And um, okay, it didn't work for that person. <laughs> so. so it goes. Well, uh, I'm sure we'll, I'm sure we'll be in touch again. And, uh, yeah. Yeah, I really appreciate it, and and uh, I'm really glad we're in touch. And uh, and uh, who knows what what will happen next? But maybe we'll do this again. And if not, I'm sure we'll talk offline. So sure, I look forward to it. Yeah, yeah. I love uh, you know. I said talking about Twin Peaks. It's a good, yeah. all good. You do, you do, you love talking about Twin Peaks. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yeah. yes, indeed. Yeah, I'm st I'm starting to I'm starting to love talking about Twin Peaks too. I don't yeah. have, I don't really have anybody to talk to so that's what that's why I'm online a lot as far as the Twin Peaks stuff goes o overly so admittedly so but <laughs> it's I I mean my wife watched it with me but other other than that I, I just can't get anybody to watch it Well I'm happy to talk about Twin Peaks we don't, right. we don't have to record something we can just chat on the phone yeah, exactly. or something uh, about Twin Peaks and then, you know uh, I I do that with Scott Brian every once in a while obviously yeah. with Josh Minton Joel Baco but you know it, they're few and far between, really. I mean, and, and, you know, when you start talking about Twin Peaks, hours go by. So. <laughs> it's true. It's true. <laughs> so, and, and they went by tonight, that's for sure. Yeah. You're, you may have to do some editing. <laughs> yeah, maybe, maybe just a little bit, but whatever. I don't know. We'll see. Yeah. <laughs> okay, man. Great. Great. Thanks a lot, and I hope you enjoy the rest of your weekend. Yes, same to you. All right, yeah. we'll talk soon. Bye, okay. Dan. Take Bye. care. <laughs>